Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks Sunday, July 17th, 2016. This is episode 1306. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Texture, the mobile app that lets you access the world's most popular magazines anytime, anywhere, using your phone or tablet. For your free trial, visit texture.com slash twit. And by Adobe Marketing Cloud. Introducing audio white papers for marketing. White papers read aloud to keep you up to date with the latest trends and technologies. Listen today by searching audio white papers for marketing on iTunes or visit adobe.com for more information. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100 plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter free at ZipRecruiter.com slash tech guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk about computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches, virtual reality, augmented reality, Pokemon Go, and anything else with a chip in it. 8888-ASK. Leo, that's my phone number. If you have a question, a comment, a suggestion, something you'd like to uh, like to get some ha help with, help with, that's what I'm here for. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight, ask Leo. And there's so much, as always, to talk about in the tech world. Sometimes it collides with what's going on in the, I'm gonna put this in air quotes, real world, uh, as it has over the last week with uh, so many world events like the uh, the coup in uh, Turkey. It's interesting because, uh, of course, as always, the coup plotters, whoever they might be, and <laughs> there's some evidence it might have been uh, Erdogan himself. I, I don't know what happened. I'm not going to comment on that, but whoever planned it, of course, as always, when there's a coup, first thing you do, you go to the radio and TV stations, you shut them down. But this time, you also shut down Facebook and Twitter. You shut down the social networks. They didn't do it uh, very effectively, and that's why Erdogan was able to use Apple's FaceTime to speak to the people, why, uh, why we saw so much video over Facebook Live and, uh, and Twitter, both of which do live video. Now YouTube's about to uh, make YouTube Live available to everybody that has a YouTube app on their smartphone. Really, is, uh, really is changing... Uh, how we perceive world events, isn't it? And and how we get the information directly, uh, in many cases, from the actors, from people in the middle of the fray. And uh, and that's so very different, of course, now in, in Baton Rouge. Another tragedy it just uh, never ends. Uh, but, uh, but again, live video from the scene, from uh, not reporters. And, you know, you can tell I'm looking at CNN right now, and they've got the, the vertical video because somebody's shooting it with their smartphone and uh, it's interesting there's a battle you know you, the, the big battles rage often over the smallest things is it gif or jif is that dress blue or gold you know the stupidest little things we fight and we've been fighting over jif and gif for years now and there's another battle over vertical versus horizontal and the folks at Snapchat and Meerkat and Periscope have all kind of favored the natural format for shooting video with a smartphone and watching it. That's, I guess, most important. Vertical. So you hold the phone up as you would as if you were making a phone call and take video. And, and, and they don't encourage you to turn it necessarily. Although I think one of them was at Periscope started saying, turn it sideways, will you? Uh, but th but people don't w they don't watch it sideways. They watch it if they're watching on their phone. They watch it vertically. So it makes sense to have that that barn door. Um, it's, it's I guess we're just gonna have to get used to it instead of you know being purists and fighting it. Right now, f trending on Facebook, a live stream from uh, Baton Rouge. How I'm curious if when news breaks. 
do you, it used to be you'd immediately turn on the TV, right? Or the, or the radio, turn on the news station on the TV or the radio and hear what's happening. I think that's changed a little bit. Certainly with younger people, I find myself even going to Twitter. And now Facebook wants, to, wants a position doing that too, to be the home of breaking news. And it's challenging for Facebook and Twitter because they don't have editorial teams. So they they don't have really mechanisms for reviewing what's going on and no they just see a lot of traffic and then a human has to quickly say well what's what's going on is this is this news uh is this gratuitous violence or sex or uh, what is it and if you know because in the latter case they'll block it but if it's news however gory or horrific uh they won't but somebody's making an editorial judgment there and it's not as it would be with a cnn or, or your news station, your news radio station. It's not uh, somebody uh, a trained, however little or much, journalist or editorial team, but, but just some employee. Does that matter? Maybe not. Maybe we're just, you know, we're getting direct access to it. It's really shaken up the news media, I can tell you. Um, the, the way the news media thinks about their job and what their job is has changed dramatically from being... Uh, a purveyor of what's going on, just the facts, ma'am, to an interpreter. And I don't, I don't think that's necessarily such a bad thing. But it does mean that we need to be educated, and I've lobbied this for this for years. Our children need to be educated, not so much in, in fact gathering any, anymore. Used to be, remember, you'd memorize state capitals and uh, the presidency of the United States. What, what's the point of memorizing state capitals if a, a quick Google search will deliver the answer? In seconds, do you need to know? Uh, I mean, it's not. I guess it's nice to have that in your brain, but do you need it in your brain? I think not. Much more important to teach kids how to figure out whether the source of the information they're getting is valid. That's a big one, isn't it? Uh, what what the biases are, because they're not necessarily obvious. Whether what you're hearing is factually true or or not. Or, and I think we especially need to know whether somebody's got an agenda. And agendas, if you have an agenda in a new media or old, usually is hidden. What's, what's their agenda? What's their hidden agenda? What, what are they trying to get you to do? We, we need to bring our kids up in this kind of in, environment and teach them critical thinking, teach them to seek the hidden agenda, not to accept everything they read. And you see it too. I, I'll tell you with the, you know, we have a 13 year old. And uh, as a younger kid, if it was on the internet, he said, well, I, I saw it on the internet. And I had to explain. <laughs> he had some very odd facts at his fingertips. And I said, Michael, where, where'd you get that one from? Oh, I saw it on YouTube. And then you have the conversation, don't you? Well, that doesn't mean it's real. He's getting wise, though. You know, that was maybe when he was in fourth grade or fifth grade. Now he's in eighth grade, and he's getting wise. He, uh, he finally realized that a, a YouTube favorite of his, a guy named McJugger Nuggets, you know, you know that, you've probably seen the videos. They're hugely viral of a father and son fighting. And in one of them, I remember seeing it. I didn't, I'll be honest with you, and here I am, you know, the cynical old Internet journalist, I didn't immediately realize it was fake. The, the father decides that his layabout son is spending too much time on his Xbox. Comes, it, the kid comes in and says, where's my Xbox? Where's the games? They're out in the backyard. The father's about to mow them over with his riding mower. The kid throws a tantrum. And the first time I saw it, I admit, and, you know, it's being filmed by his kid brother who's chortling. <laughs> and, if, and they're good actors. They're good enough that it fooled me and it fooled Michael. In fact... For the longest time, we, we had a debate. No, that's not. I said, that's fake. That's not real. That's an ad. He said, no, no, that's real. Well, they've, he's finally realized, partly because McJuggernuggets has, <laughs> has continued on his juggernaut. And, uh, and finally, I think he killed, I think he, I hate to even say this, he killed his father. It's a, it's a, it's a prank. It's a joke. He didn't really. In fact, his father's in on it. In the, his, uh, but that's the last, and that was the last one. I think it was his way of saying, I don't want to do this anymore. By then, Michael had figured out it was fake. 
In a way, that was a good lesson, right? Something that seemed so real. For me, too. Something that seemed so real. Now, I view things, I see a video or I see a picture on the internet, I, I'm immediately skeptical. Are you? I know not all of you are because I still get the emails. <laughs> you won't believe what happened. And it's, you know, I, I have to, I get it from family members. I have to send a note out saying, you might want to, where do you send people? Snopes, right? Snopes is S-N-O-P-E-S. -E it's a great website where they debunk uh, internet my myths that spread so far. And sometimes you see the same myth over and over. That's the lesson I think we, we all, our kids have to learn, but we have to learn too. A little critical thinking, more important than ever. 8888-ASK-LEO. Let's talk high tech right after this. The large bird taking off with a baby. Clearly faked. You know, one of the reasons this came up, and I didn't want to really talk about it and glorify it, but there's an Australian group that's been making fake videos trying to convince mainstream media to take the videos. And they say, oh, it's just, you know, we're just demonstrating how gullible mainstream media is. And yeah, that's something. But they're also trolling mainstream media, aren't they? And and they're going to great lengths to make these videos look real. Like the guy being chased by the bear. What was it? Skier? Is this the original? Yeah, this is the original. So this is being made by an Australian group um, to, con to fool media. And they carry it. She's singing Rihanna. It's uploaded in April. It's had 8 million views. So now they... The video editor is going to edit in something. But you can do it so well now that... Uh, you, you might not notice. <laughs> it's kind of well done, isn't it? Now, if you saw that and you were the uh, news director at KABC and you were looking for some good viral video to close the nightly newscast with, would you go with it? You might. I've become quite skeptical. I know, me too. Working in a newsroom and... Yeah. Good. Well, I hope they, they're becoming quite skeptical. This was an Australian group that was doing all of this. Um, and then they finally went public saying, uh, yeah, we were, we were, but look at all the stories saying, is it real? Is it a hoax? And Snopes finally has the. It's better to not be, it's better to be right than first, I guess is the motto that we yeah. worked on. In the, yeah, but you know what? No. Are trying to be first. <laughs> Trying to no, be first you may ratings. say that, but I don't think that's really. Well, no, I know. <laughs> they may say that that's they pay why lip jump service. On things that are totally yeah. false, and then they have to. I don't think it matters really, uh, as long as you get, you know. Hence I mean, it, the. Uh, well, they fall for stuff. It's embarrassing. Wong and the but, yeah, something wrong. But no, you know, <laughs> that's pretty embarrassing. <laughs> but people, well, just a little. <laughs> most of the time, it's not so obvious and so bad, right? <laughs> we too low. <laughs> Bang that was out. terrible. I felt I felt really <laughs> poor Tori. Campbell. When I, I, you know her? No, no, no. I not personally. But you but feel for her though, I because we've all her. been kind of in that, in that boat. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. That's the phone number. We were watching uh, during the break. Kim Schaffer and I were watching the famous. We now know hoax video of the snowboarder being chased by a bear. And it was well done. I mean, it was subtle, too. They didn't, like, have the bear come up and bite her or anything. They just it was in the distance. It was, it was you know, believable. But you, you say, Kim, having worked for years in radio news, that you would not have fallen for that? Um, well, I can't say whether I would have or not. I'm just saying, working in the newsroom, we double, uh, double and triple and quadruple yeah. check. You do sources. now, don't you? Yeah, yeah, because too many people have been bitten by the uh, just wanting to get on that story first and too fast. Well, I think that's responsible if you could. Yeah. I'm not convinced, though, that there's a, a huge penalty. There seems to be more of a reward for getting it first than getting than the penalty for getting it wrong. I don't think there's any kind of penalty. It's just embarrassment. It's embarrassing, <laughs> but people forget it, and you move on, and you know, and they and what you want, of course, is to, for people to think, well, if you know, and news breaks, we'll have it first, right? right? 
And I think there's a lot of pressure on the both traditional news media and uh, and the new media. It's just amazing with like the Twitters how fast stuff comes out now and how you can. You check. can't keep up if you. That's why I think if you're if you're traditional media, what you should look at is not trying to break news because you can't. You're yeah. not going to beat Twitter. When Prince died, where did I hear about it on Twitter? I saw it on Facebook or Twitter. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, when and Bowie same with died, Michael Jackson. And when Michael years Jackson ago. and even Michael Jackson years ago. And it was TMZ. It was TMZ yeah. that that had yeah. tweeted it that I saw that. I think, uh, I think, I, I wonder. I think there's still a kind of pressure to be first, even if oh, you're wrong. Is. And now what they do is they say, "Well, it could be a hoax, but look at this bear chasing the snowboarder." <laughs> In fact, I was just doing a, a Google search of it, and most of the news media that published that video said real or fake. Hmm, could it be a hoax, but they still published it. Right? Well, and every celebrity that's died this year. It's oh, it's a hoax. It's a hoax. That's a the hoax. one you don't want to get wrong because that's yeah. really embarrassing. It, yeah, and, especially and if kind of hurtful. Comes out and says, no, yeah, kind of hurtful. Yeah. Yeah. Real or fake? We don't know. But Paul McCartney, thank God, is still alive. Yes, he that's, is. That's <laughs> that's the bottom line there. So you've been collecting callers, I, I see. Yeah, like Pokemon. Yeah, <laughs> gotta catch them all. I got a I got a very angry note from a listener, and I apologize, sir. He says, uh, I love you. I love the show. <laughs> but please, no more Pokemon Go. But uh, this happens. Of course, you know, when Apple comes out with a new phone, I get the same emails. No more. Let's not talk about this anymore. This is how it is in the news biz, right? The big story, you talk about it. Yeah. Till there's the next big story. And I think you can't deny that Pokemon Go is a story. It's huge. I'm driving in today. Usually I walk. I twisted my ankle playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> weren't and paying attention to where you were going. Were got you? boo-boos all over me. I, <laughs> oh, no. uh, actually, the, the irony of it is I, was, I, was, I had been playing Pokemon Go and walking briskly into work uh, yesterday. And I said, no, no, I got to pay attention. Put it away. And then I fell. <laughs> Just don't fall off the segue. But I think it was related. I think it was like, well, you know, as I'm putting away the phone not to play Pokemon Go, I'm paying even less attention. I don't know. Anyway, I blame Pokemon Go for my, my injuries. <laughs> so I'm driving in because I can't walk today. And everywhere, you and it's very distinctive. First of all, people playing the game tend to be in packs, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I think, one of the cool things. It's social. And there's a distinctive look where they're kind of carrying their phone out in front of them. And, and you know, first just waiting for a, a Pokemon to show up and then that, that and typical vertical <laughs> flick. And they stop to do that and then they go on. And it's very distinctive. If you're in New York, you saw, did you see the video in Central Park? I did not. Uh, a couple of nights ago, you could, you could find it on YouTube. A couple of nights ago, apparently, uh, you know, there's there's all kinds, there's hundreds of Pokemon. It's one of the rarer ones. Somebody in Central Park, somebody shouts, whatever. Here's a Venonaut over here. And <laughs> throngs, hundreds of people. The video shows a guy jumping out of his car in the street stops the car oh. jumps out and goes runs chasing <laughs> hundreds of people chasing this rare pokemon and you tell me that that's not a news story that's not a phenomenon i don't know if it's good or bad i think personally it's good because people are walking they're talking they're out at night it's it's uh, like it used to be remember the old days people go out at night talk walk the promenade <laughs> it's kind of like that again admittedly we're staring at our phones more but Got to take what you can get. Let's take a caller. You've been preparing well, them. And yes, and Jacob in Arkansas is a gamer and wants to play a game with his friend. It's not Pokemon Go, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> Social gaming is very big. Hi, Jacob. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Oh, Jacob. Nice to talk to you. How old are you, Jacob? 11. And what game do you want to play with your buddy? Ark Survival Evolve. Oh, Evolve. Yeah, that's kind of cool. That's where you, uh, you're in a world with dinosaurs. Right. Yeah, and then uh, and then you kind of want, it's an open world. You're wandering around, and then you try to tame one, right, and and evolve them. It's a little bit like yeah. Pokemon Go with dinosaurs, in a much more rich and vivid game. Is it a it's it's is it a multiplayer? It is, isn't it? Yes, you can join people's server, or you can create your own. And people can join yours. Cool. So, how can I help you? Um. Well, I have. My PC, my friend has an Xbox One. Ah. Do we both want to play with each other? Like, do I have to have uh, the? Do we have to have the same console or something, or is it? 
So yeah. this is a. Uh, there are games that you can play on the Xbox One and the PC. I don't know if Evolve is uh, is one of them. Um, maybe somebody in the chat room will know. I've played. I played it on my Xbox One. It's called Survival Evolved. Is it out yet, or is it still in uh, beta? I think it's still. It's not officially released yet, is it? I'm, I'm I was, not sure. I was playing the beta version when it came out. So the reason sure. some games let you do this and some don't, and the reason is people on a PC with a keyboard and mouse on some games like Call of Duty have an advantage over people using a game controller. And it may be the other way with driving games and things like that. And so it's often in multiplayer online games, it's often uh, a question about whether they're going to allow that because... Now, I would say Survival Evolved is a good example of a game where I think you wouldn't have an advantage either way. Be kind of like Minecraft. But then it's a question of the programmers who wrote the game making it, you know, their servers cross-platform. So the answer is, I don't know, but I will, I will look for you, Jacob. Uh, okay. Unless it specifically sh shows a server that you both can join, it probably isn't. You know, Minecraft, okay. you know that. Minecraft's like that. You play it on the PC, you can only play PC servers. Mm -hmm. and, and you play it on the Xbox, you have to join the Realm servo servers, and you can't be both. You can't be both. You can only be one or the other. By the way, Microsoft yeah. wants to change that. They're going to make Minecraft completely cross-platform. And most Xbox games eventually will be. That's kind of controversial, actually. Some people were mad about that. But I like the idea that it doesn't matter if you're playing on PC or Xbox. Uh, looks like you... Let's, I don't know. I'm going to have to do some research for you, Jacob, and see if I can find out. Keep listening, okay? Mm -hmm. We'll come back after the break, and I'll, I'll find out. My chat room, the fabulous chat room, is working on it. If you want to be in the chat room, go to our website, techguylabs.com, and the, the address and the information is there. Can we play together? Hmm. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Okay, brought to you by my good friends at Texture. I kind of feel like they're my friends because I use the Texture app on vacation. I love magazines. I'm not, who doesn't love magazines? Texture is basically the easiest way to describe it is Netflix for magazines. If you go to Texture, T-E-X-T-U-R-E dot com slash twit, you can get a free trial and kind of see for yourself. On your phone, on your tablet, the idea is Texture lets you read your favorite magazines for one low monthly fee. So you can, just like you binge on movies with Netflix, you can binge on magazines with Texture, National Geographic, and Wired, Rolling Stone, and Esquire, Sports Illustrated. The complete magazine, by the way, on the newsstand, every page, plus bonus content you can't put in a magazine, uh, like video, plus uh, preview, you know, back issues. So you And you favorite the magazines you want. You get on an airplane, they're already downloaded. You, it's just awesome. If you want to branch out and try other magazines, they have you know, dozens and dozens. They have an editorial staff that'll pick top stories and new and noteworthy sections. Texture makes it really easy to find stuff you care about. There's always something great to read when you have texture, and I really like that. And you know, a tablet or a phone is a great way to read magazines. The pictures are more vibrant. I, you know, I, of course, I used to subscribe to the National Geographic when the kids were little. For about the price of that subscription, now I get the National Geographic on my tablet. It's beautiful, those pictures pop. They're all there, and all these other magazines. I'm a big fan. I know you will be. That's why we've arranged a free trial for you. Visit texture.com slash twit and try your free trial. You can choose the basic $10 a month plan, or if you want every magazine they offer, the premium for 15 bucks a month, that's still a lot cheaper than buying the magazines in the newsstand or subscribing. I love it. Texture.com slash twit. Try it free right now. Well, thanks to the chat room, bad news for Jacob and his buddy. They want to play a new game, which is a fun game called Ark Survival Evolved, in which you get to ride dinosaurs. You play a caveman. It's a what we call a MMORPG, a massively multiplayer online role-playing game, or Murberg. And... Um, you can play it on Steam, which means, and I think Mac or PC, Mac or Windows. And then you can also play it on your console, Xbox or PlayStation. But I am special in our chat room. 
found the sad words. I think he found it on uh, on Steam. That you cannot play cr what we call cross-platform. In other words, they they have a version for PCs and Macs, and they have a version, you know, for Steam, and they have a version for consoles, and even the updates are not in sync. So. Bad news, Jacob. Currently, you can't do that. Here's the quote. ARC will not be cross-platform. Each version of the game will have their own official servers and receive the content updates at different times, as well as have some technical differences, so cross-platform would not be possible. But as I mentioned, my, uh, Microsoft really wants to make it possible to play Xbox games on PCs and vice versa. And in fact, you kind of can now with the new Windows uh, 10 update for the Xbox. You have... Um, the ability to stream a game from an Xbox to your PC. That's not quite the same. But I think it's Microsoft's intent, since they are the Windows company and the Xbox company, that, that most games can be played on both platforms. 8888, Ask Leo. That's the number if you want to talk about this or anything else uh, on your mind. I guess I get some window cleaner. I can't read the <laughs> screen here. Somebody's been spitting on my phone. Richard in West L.A., you're next. Hi, Richard. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Good to talk. Good to talk to you. About five or six years ago, I created a, a, a video lasting maybe about 11 minutes. I uploaded it to Picasa, and I've been trying to, and, and I burned a copy. I've been trying to burn another one, but all I'm getting is a picture, a still picture of the first scene in my video. Is that from Picasso or from the DVD that you burned? No, Picasso. I've tried to duplicate the, the um, DVD, and I don't quite know why, but I can't do it. I've tried everything. Yeah. I, I think you often recommend Handbrake. Yeah. I, for some reason, I couldn't download that. There was a lot of stuff going on there. I'll try that again. But uh, Make sure you get it from the original that. site. Uh, when I hear a lot of stuff going on, that worries me. You know, a lot of people go to sites like download.com and Softpedia to download uh, free software. And don't. Get it from the original company, in this case, handbrake.fr. H A N D. Yeah, H A N D B R A K E, like a handbrake in a car. Right. .fr. It's a French company. Because what happens if you go to these download sites? It does look like there's a lot of other stuff going on, including their own download wrapper, which often installs adware on your system prior to installing the program you wanted. So I, you know, all that stuff. I you were smart. You were right. Yeah, Handbrake.fr. That will. What that does is you put the DVD in. It's a, is it a DVD you could look at in a DVD player? Yes. Uh, like any DVD. So that's a true DVD as opposed to a data disc. You know, you can burn CDs and DVDs as just like a hard drive with files on it. That's right. what we call a data disc. But you made a video disc that could be played on any DVD player. Right. Handbrake I, would... I hadn't seen it in a while. I tried it out last night and it worked fine in my player. Okay, as long as you can still use it. Sometimes, you know, by the way, people assume that DVDs and CDs last forever. They don't. Uh, they can corrode, believe it or not. The metal substrate can corrode and they can be unreadable in a matter of a few years. So um, an old DVD may be unreadable. But if you were able to play it in your player, Handbrake will be able to rip it. And probably a better choice than Picasa. You remember what happened is that Google bought this company, Picasa, wonderful company. They made a very nice photo organization and, and kind of simple editing program. They bought it. They gave it. They started giving it away. Kudos to Google. And they created a web interface called Picasa Web. And then when the Google Plus frenzy occurred at the company, they decided to kill it and in, in kind of incorporate it into Google Plus and Google Photos. So, in theory, all of your content should still be available at photos.google.com. Have you looked? No, I haven't tried that. So, in theory, I think, I think it just automatically transferred your Picasso web stuff over. So, there's another place to look. It might still be there. Uh, if it's a thing, what, go go ahead. Ahead, I'm sorry. If it's a video, it should show up as a video. You can store videos there. When I've tried to play it on Picasso, it works fine. You Good. Click on it and, and it Good. works fine. Good. When I when I well now if you're playing there, it, you, know, you, you if have you're, that ability to send it if, to Gmail. If you're playing it locally on Picasa, that means yeah. it's on your hard drive. Right. So you have a copy. All you don't need Handbrake. You already have a copy on your hard drive. So in Picasa, and I can't burn another copy. Well, maybe not from Picasa, but you have a copy of the original 
AVI or MOV or whatever that video file was on your hard drive. And Picasso, the program, is playing it back. I, I apologize. I thought you were you had uploaded it and you were trying to get it off the upload site. But it's still on your hard drive if you're playing it with Picasso. Hmm. So and where would I find that, though? Then? Well, I don't remember. I mean, there's probably a right-click and show uh, folder, or there's some way to go to the original file in uh, the Picasso menu structure. Look for that. I will. Uh, almost certainly, there's a way to see the original file. And then that original file, that's what you should burn, because that's all you'd be making with Handbrake is you'd be kind of recreating that original file in a lesser quality. So you want the original, ideally. Then right. don't don't maybe don't burn it with Picasso because they're out of biz. You know they they close that down and maybe some of the features are gone. You could but there are many burning programs you can get on Windows PCs. There's a huge number. Um, okay. And just Give burn it, it with that. Yeah, it's still there. If you can see it in the program, it's uh, it's still there. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, Gadget Hog, who still remembers how Picasso works, says right click the the entry and and choose locate from the pop-up menu, and that will actually locate the original file that you're playing back. Note where it is, because that's where Picasso's putting everything. There's, you know, there's probably a folder. It might be in my videos, the traditional Windows folder, or it might be Picasso created its own folder structure. That's unknown. You know, that can vary. Uh, but note where it is. When you right-click it and choose Locate, you're going to find it somewhere. Tom in New Hampshire. Hello, Tom. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Oh, I gotta push this button too. Hey, Tom. Hey, Leo. There you are. How are you? I'm great. Welcome. How are you? Thank you. Well, I love your show. I love your Twit Network. Thank you. I download, I download the shows every week. You That's wonderful. That's our podcast network. T W I T stands for This Week in Tech. At yeah. T W I T dot TV. What can I do for you? Well, I just got on Amazon Prime Day this week the tap. You I won't say the regular word. I don't want to tickle, tickle everybody's speakers. <laughs> you mean an, an echo? World. An Amazon echo? <laughs> yes, yes. You call it pata. pata. <laughs> well, let's call it the tap. How's that? Mm. The echo anyway. tap, yeah. I love the echo yeah, tap. I have an echo dot in my bedroom, and I have it hooked up yeah, to nice. nice speakers, and it's just wonderful. Yeah, it went on sale. I had saved almost enough money for it, and then it went on sale. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll get the tap now. I don't yeah, need pro it was Prime Day, right? They had a deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. It was 30% it was off. Wow, good deal. Anyway. They really should be selling that for less because it's just an amazing portal to buying all sorts of stuff from Amazon. Yes, it is. <laughs> you can tell it. You know, you're in, I, I'm off and I'm brushing my teeth and I run out of toothpaste and I go, Echo, buy some toothpaste. And it'll go, yeah. okay, I see this toothpaste. Would you like that? Yeah, buy that. <laughs> and, and then it's amazing. It's like a personal assistant my... In my bedroom. Hey, let's take a break. We got to take a break uh, because, uh, uh, well, that's life. Commercials, you know. Yes. Somebody's got to pay the bills here. But yes. uh, when we come back, uh, let's talk a little more about the. Uh, so anything that you say about the Amazon Tap applies to the Dot and the Echo as well. Right. They're all right. the same so family. Ask about the skills. Okay, we'll talk about skills when we come back. Leo Laporte, yep. the tech guy. Thank you, you gadget hog, for doing that. He's very nice, a boy. Yes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, imagine, what do they say? There's like millions of people on these things. It's kind of cool. Kind of cool platform. Pretty. I would say in a few, you know, five years, ten years, probably ten years, it'll be just commonplace that you'll just talk to your house. And tell it to do things, or your car, or your whatever, your phone. It's just going to be kind of the way it is. We'll we'll wonder how do we survive without that? How do we? Man, you had to type things in, do all that work. Let me see if this works. Echo, what is the capital of South Dakota? South Dakota's capital city is Pierre. So I don't need to memorize that anymore, right? Echo, who was the 16th president of the United States? The 16th U.S. president was Abraham Lincoln. See, I don't have to remember that stuff anymore. Echo, can you name the presidents of the United States in order? Hmm. I can't find no. the answer to the question I heard. That'd be kind of cool. But you don't really need that, do you? It's probably, you know, there's other reasons to do that. I mean, it's good for kids to mem do memorization and... 
stuff like that. Yeah, I think I think this is going to be uh, commonplace. Uh, okay. Mm, gotta catch them all. Echo, what is the square root of sixty-four? The square root of sixty-four is eight. Echo, what is the square root of negative one? The square root of minus one is i. Wow. It even does irrational numbers. I'm sorry, imaginary numbers. <laughs> sorry, John, thank you. Echo, what is the square root of pi? The square root of pi is roughly 1.7724539. <laughs> Echo, what is pi? The number pi is a mathematical constant, the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter, commonly approximated as 3.14159. Echo, can you tell me pi to 25 digits? Probably not. Hmm. No. I can't find the answer to the question I heard. That'd be kind of fun. <sighs> Echo, when does Star Trek come out? The movie Star Trek XI was released in 2009. No, that's not the one I'm talking about. Echo, when does the new Star Trek movie come out? Sorry, I didn't understand the question I heard. She's only half smart, right? Echo, what is 17 divided by zero? 17 divided by zero is undefined. See? She's good at math. What is the name of the movie? I, I don't even know. See, I, you, in theory, you shouldn't have to know that, right? Echo, name the U.S. presidents in order. Sorry, I didn't understand the question I heard. Yeah, she can't do that. Echo, when does Star Trek Beyond come out? The movie Star Trek Beyond is released in 2016. <laughs> That's not helpful. All right, we're talking about the uh, Amazon Echo. I'm careful to say, as, as, as you should be too, Tom, the word... Hell, E X A, because that's her name, right. and when you say that out loud, she responds, and she's scary. Mom. But mine, I've called Echo, which means yeah. that every time we talk about it, it she responds. Yeah, mine won't do that because it's just a tap. It's only the button you have to press. Ah, so that yeah, like that's right. The tap you actually have to press the button. That's right. Yeah, right, right. So, so you want to know about skills? I heard you playing with, you playing with awesome. Yeah, that was funny. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I, you know, I was saying at the beginning of the uh, show, uh, you don't really need to know uh, the president's right. in order anymore or the state right. capitals. You can just ask. Uh, you can Google anything. You can Google anything or you can ask yeah. Echo. And she right. and she knows. Echo, who is the uh, 12th president of the United States? I don't even know that one, you know. Hmm. I can't find the answer to oh, the question. I was asking I too many things. Yeah. I mean, yeah Echo, <laughs> who was the 12th president of the United States? The 12th U.S. president was Zachary Taylor. I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm I sure. knew the one you did before, the 16th one. I knew that one. The 16th one, yeah, everybody, yeah, everybody knows that one. Yeah, that one I, I chose that one so that we would know if she was right. Because <laughs> what if, if she'd said Zachary Taylor, then we'd go, mm mm mm. Wait a minute, that's wrong. So, Echo's an interesting story because you can add skills to the Echo. Right. Um, you know, so it I comes. The tap. Yeah. Yeah, or the tap. It's the oh, same. The phone. You can even do it, by the way, there's, there's an Echo app. You could do it to the app. You can, That's what I've been doing. You can download a software and put it on a Raspberry Pi. I mean, Amazon's yeah, really that. decided to make this a, a kind of a platform that can be everywhere. And I imagine we'll see it in cars and speakers and other things as well. So it's fairly easy to write a skill. In fact, I've been meaning to do this. Anybody with some programming uh, skill can use Amazon's platform. They have a very interesting... Um, cloud-based platform for Echo skills, and they're not hard to write. They're limited in the way you can implement them. And, of course, if you look at the Alexa app, you'll see the... Oops, I said the word. If you look at the app... <laughs> sorry. You'll see the uh, skills are many, many pages. But the newest thing they did is you don't have to anymore turn a skill on in the app. You can actually turn it on by talking to 
echo. But that's the trick. You have to know what the skill is. But you have to know what the skill is, exactly. But that's what I want to ask you. I want to see, is there a web page that's regularly updated with the app? Because on the iPhone, you swipe past the app, then you get to tap into it, read the, read the I know. Then enable it. Then go back and hope you're, st and I'm visually impaired, so I can't just quickly scan down the Oh, phone yeah. Phone just on. Yeah. Is there, is there a website that where they are regularly, regularly publishing in a list? And then go in later and enable it either the app or on the speaker. Um, I doesn't uh, can't you do that in um, in the Amazon? I think you can go to the Amazon.com site and look in devices and find the skills there. But here's a website. I don't know. You know, it's it's I an went, I went looking on the Amazon page. And, recently. I couldn't find it. Oh, anywhere. that's annoying. Well, here's I mean, a website. You the speakers, but you can't see the. The skills. Here's a website. I don't think it's run by Amazon, so there would be no guarantee that they keep it up to date. But it's up to date, at least as far as I can tell, for uh, right now. It's called AlexaSkillsStore.com. AlexaSkillsStore.com. Okay. And you can search, which is what you want. They have them broken down into categories. They also have best and they have popular so um, you know one of the one of the skills I really love is Jeopardy, and you're right. You have to know how to I've been ask. Playing, I love that. Isn't it fun? You get I six have, questions a day. Yeah. Yeah, so, that and the twenty in the twenty questions. I played that yesterday. I beat it twice. It's pretty good, isn't it? It's yeah. pretty good though. I mean, it knows how to do it. There's a a fun one that's called the seven minute workout. We'll work. Yeah, we'll walk yeah. you through a workout. Um, and that one for the Apple TV as well. Yeah. So they're they're really expanding uh, quite quickly, and the fact that you're right. The fact that you can add a skill with voice. See, I would imagine, you tell me, but I would imagine if you're blind, the the echo is a amazing thing. Well, I've just been playing with it since I got it Friday. Oh, it's brand new for you. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, so I mean, I've been hearing you talk about it, and other people talk about it. Like, that's it. I'm going to try it, and I'm thinking I'll go in small and do the tap first and see if I like it. You know, it's a small investment. Oh. Uh, let, me, let me just try something. All right. Echo... Add the pizza facts skill. Let's I've see. added pizza facts skill to your shopping list. Okay. Ec <laughs> ec shopping list? Well, now I'm yeah, going to get pizza. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, pizza. That was not what I expected. <laughs> so no. you can see we've got a ways to go. But on the other hand, uh, I would think for a blind user, given that the whole interaction can be done with voice in your ears, would, this would be a phenomenal technology. Yeah. And do you know that you can ask a well with the, with the um, echo one? You can ask her the uh, battery percentage. Yes, if you have a Tesla, if you have a Tesla, you can ask the battery percentage of your car. You can yeah. control charging. Of the, of the actual the uh, tap, I pressed the button on the tap. I said, "What's the battery level?" And she, she told me. Uh, you can also, um, if you have uh, a device for your OBD2 port, I use something called the Automatic. They're a sponsor of our shows. Well, I hope I don't have that. If, being blind. <laughs> you, you shouldn't be driving. I understand. No, I shouldn't. <laughs> but if you have the Automatic, so, you put that in your OBD2 port, and now I can ask my car how much gas is left, which is kind of cool. Convenient. There's that a lot of little things. If you have a Nest thermostat, you can turn the heat right. up and down. And I would imagine as a, as a blind person, that would be, there's some really, not, you know, as it gets more and more capable, to be some really that's useful about finding all these skills you know i mean you, you like you said you have like what 20 pages of them now how do you find the one you want there are i think now well, almost a thousand i mean i think there are yeah. a huge number of skills so this yes, website yes. is the closest thing i've found to amazon skill store alexa skill okay. store yeah okay all right. and it's alexaskillstore.com all right, I'll look and, at that later. Yeah, and you have a screen reader, I guess. Yes, I have uh, system access. It looks like a pretty uh, accessible site. It looks like mostly just text. That's good. Um, so, uh, and and you can see there's communications, education, entertainment, finance, games, home so automation. You click on one, and then it gives you the description. I'm assuming. Yeah. 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 And it tells All you, right. which is good, how you add the skill, and and then what the syntax for the skill is. But that's important. So here's one called Learn Simple Multiplication and Division. You right. know, I wonder if this is uh, an Amazon site because there's an Enable button ah. right, right on the site. May or maybe it just the, links to... On the skill, you mean? Yeah. yeah, so I'm enabling this skill, Learn Simple Multiplication and Division. Mm -hmm. And then um, the way you would invoke the skill is written down here. It says, and I'll try this... So right. this is skills enabled. 
Echo opens simple multiplication division. Now it's thinking. Let's learn about simple multiplication and division. I will ask you about five questions. Try to get as many right as you can. Kids love Let's this. Let's begin. I mean, this what is, is 16 divided by 4? Four? 4. That answer is correct. Your score is 1. What is 20? So this is like the Jeopardy. I'll stop it now. Right. But this That's is like. You don't have to keep pressing the button on the tab. You just stay open and while you're. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think you'd like the speech the speech one, but the nice thing about the tap is it's very you don't have to worry about people like me say, right. saying the word. We have numerous users uh, of the Amazon uh, Echo who get mad at me regularly because I trigger they're listening to the radio show. Often they're listening to they, you know, you can listen to all of our shows on the Echo using TuneIn. And yeah. uh, often they're listening to our shows and in the middle of the show I'll the show will stop and the Echo will start doing things. Right, that's it. That's not a fun. That's a bad no, prank. I wouldn't think. Yeah. I've been waiting all day to hear. It. How do you like the voice? You th you wish you could change the voice, or is that okay? No, with I like the voice is pretty cool. I think. I think the voice is right on. It's pretty clear. It's you very know, good for a synthesized voice, don't you? Yeah, think? I think it's very. I wonder what they got. I don't know of any other one that sound anything close to that. I just noticed on my Android device the Google Maps voice has become much better as well. Oh, yeah, I've heard that, but I'm an iPhone user, so I don't care about yeah, that. Yeah, well, I bet uh, Google Maps on the iPhone would also too. sound better. I don't think it uses yeah. Siri's voice. I th I think that we're getting, we're, we're, I mentioned this during the break, uh, I think we're close. I think within the next decade, the idea of just talking to your div your house or yeah. your office will become commonplace. And we'll just get used to, you know, that's how we operate. Um, for Absolutely. not everything, you'll still type to write things and do Facebook. Or dictation, like with the iPhone. My wife and I, we both use dictation a lot on our iPhone. I love that. Both terrible typers and she has terrible palsy. I yeah. have terrible palsy and it's just hard to type on these little screens. Well, even if, <laughs> I have a hard, even if everybody you're, if you, everybody has a hard time. Those screens are right. tiny and I have giant fingers. No, they're, they're not tiny, but yeah, yeah, tiny enough. My, they're they're right. small, the keys are smaller than my fingers. It's hey, not, it's nice talking to you. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Have a great one. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Take a break for your local news. There's lots of it, sad to say. But we'll be right back with more Toy Talk after this. <sighs> what is... Alec <laughs> Sorry. Echo, what is the equation to determine the air volume in a subwoofer enclosure? She's not going to know hmm. that. I can't find the answer She's to the question. She's not going to know heard. that. What are you nuts? Well, it sounds like Echo doesn't know about Google. Echo needs to know about Google. <laughs> it's easy yeah. Google Incorporated, the internet technology business. See, she does. That's all she knows. <laughs> Echo, do you know about the NSA? The National Security Agency, NSA, the military intelligence agency governed by the United States Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. Echo, is the NSA listening? Mm. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> wah, wah. Wah, wah. That's really her. Wah, wah. That's her no comment. She cannot comment. That is She's a no. She's not at liberty to discuss. That such is a matters. no comment. Because otherwise, she'd say, I don't know what you're talking about. That would be a more sassy answer. I'd like that. I don't really care. Hey, NSA analyst. Nice to see you. I, you know why I don't care? I'm on the freaking radio all the time. Right. <laughs> the NSA doesn't have to go far to find out what I'm thinking. Not <laughs> Just at all. turn on twit.tv, baby. <laughs> and I have no filter, so... <laughs> if... <laughs> If I were up to no good, unless it's a carefully planned disguise as a person, a goofball who has no filter. But in really, in reality, I'm a Soviet sleeper cell waiting to be triggered. But if I were a Soviet sleeper cell waiting to be triggered, would I say that I was a Soviet sleeper cell waiting to be triggered? Or would that be a great ruse, a way to hide the fact that I, in fact, am? A Soviet sleeper cell waiting to be hidden. Trigger. And every guest that comes in here is an FBI or NSA agent. Because <laughs> they figured you out. 
Just call me comrade. You wondered why I talk with Russian accent so good? Because it is my native language. Здравствуйте, как поживаешь, товарищ? I wish uh, she could do a translation. Maybe she can. Echo, how do you say good morning in French? I can't pronounce that, but I've written the translation for you. Yeah. See, Google can pronounce it. Echo, the Red Hawk flies it done. It is done by Kim Burrell from Spotify. <laughs> what? <laughs> We have triggered thermonuclear war. These last sounds you hear will be slushy music from Spotify. Oh Lord, I need this is nice. Oh Lord, I need Echo, stop. Echo, what is a copyright violation? Sorry, I don't know the answer. To I your know question. you don't, obviously. Echo, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B-A, start. Super Alexa mode, activated. Starting reactors, online. <laughs> Enabling advanced systems, online. <laughs> Raising dongers, error. Dongers missing, aborting. Wow. What the what? I just thought it was a Nintendo thing. <laughs> uh, what is a donger? <laughs> Dongle. Echo, what is a donger? Sorry, I can't find the answer to the question I heard. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, virtual reality, headgear, augmented reality, Pokemon Go. Anything on your mind, if it has a chip in it, if it's about technology, I like to talk about it. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. We've been talking about the uh, kind of the amazing Amazon Echo, this this device. But Amazon's not even really the leader in this, are they? I mean, uh, they're the first to put this device in our houses that we can talk to, but... We've been talking to our phones for a while with Microsoft with Cortana and Apple with Siri. And, of course, Google has, uh, you know, their little thing that they you say and that talks to you. And do you use it is my question. I think one of the things is, you know, we have these capabilities. I have to laugh. I have a good friend who <laughs> whenever we're, you know, like I ask, what's showing downtown or... I wonder if there's music nearby or, what, you know, is there a restaurant, anything. She has this kind of sad uh, and persistent faith in Siri. And so she'll ask her. And I just, it's hard for me not to laugh because she, it's invariably useless, wrong. And, uh, and so after a while, most people would just go, well, I'm not going to ask that anymore. Uh, and does, eventually that happens with all of these because none of them are perfect. And all you have to do is get a few useless answers when you before you kind of go, okay, I'm not going to ask anymore. Or do you? I'm curious if there's anybody out there who uses uh, these voice recognition technologies regularly. There's some uh, cool things, you know. I mean, uh, Google has a translate program that allows you to have real-time audio conversations with people in different languages. It's kind of... Amazing. I mean, if, if if 30 years ago you'd say, well, look at this. Here's I have this little pocket device. I speak in English and it comes out in French and then the French person speaks in French and it comes out in English and we can have a conversation in very close to real time. It's very fast. Um, that would be science fiction. It is science fiction. And we just get used to it. Oh, yeah, I can do that. Skype has that capability now, too. Microsoft's put that into Skype where you... You could have kind of in, instantaneous real time translation. What's interesting, I mean, if you haven't used that recently, at first it was pretty bad. It was almost laughably, the translations were almost laughably bad. They've gotten much better. And I've had conversations uh, in Chinese, for instance, and in French, and I've asked 
the person I'm talking to, is that pretty idiomatic? Is that, does it sound like, uh, you know, kind of robotic? In the past, you could understand it, but it wasn't how a normal person would talk. It's become more and more natural and idiomatic over time. That's pretty impressive. Pretty amazing. Douglas Adams in his Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, wonderful comedy science fiction novel series. Actually, it was a radio show first, then a novel, then a movie. Uh, invented something called the Babel Fish, which is a weird live fish that you would put in your ear. <laughs> <laughs> and then it would do the, do exactly this. It would do simultaneous translation so you could understand any language. We have it. It's called Google Translate. You can even aim the Translate app at a sign, turn on the camera, aim it at the sign, and it'll translate a sign into a new language. I've used that in Germany. It was amazing. It's, so we, you know, it's kind of a, an incredible thing we have in our pockets, and yet we just kind of, yeah, well, yeah take it for granted. Yeah, man, I got that. I don't use it that much, you know. It's not, not that I don't, I don't, I don't really need it that much. I just like, you know, if I say it louder, they understand. Chris, Miami, Florida, you're next. Hi, Leo Laporte, the Tech. Hi, Chris. Hey, hang on a minute, Leo. Give come on, come on off. over to the phone, Chris. I want to get you off. Yeah, I'm off. I'm here. I'm here. Hey, how are you? <laughs> I'm always good when I give you a call. You, know. you are. You are such a happy person. I am. Well, you got to be, right? I mean, what's the point of being miserable? You might as well just dig a hole and get it over with. <laughs> okay, I mean, okay. I think, you know, I just saw Inside Out, the uh, the Pixar movie. There's a there's a place for sadness in the in life. Well, yeah, I mean, there are, there are times if someone unfortunately passes on or yeah. loses a job. I mean, yeah. there are times, but I try to be upbeat 95 to 100 Why not? Why not? Enjoy Why not? It. Enjoy yeah. it. There's enough to, enough to sadden us. Hey, now yeah. let me ask you because you're in. Are you in Miami proper in the city? No, I'm actually in a. Uh, I'm outside. I'm on um, 79th Street in Biscayne. I'm in a little city called North Bay Village. We're an island community between uh, Miami and North Bay and uh, Miami Beach. Do you see? And there's probably a lot of older people there. Do you see uh, people playing uh, Pokemon Go in your your neighborhood? <laughs> <laughs> I see them everywhere. In fact, I was doing it for a while, and it made me nuts, so I gave up for a while. <laughs> yeah. Our friend, uh, Father Robert Balasser, the digital Jesuit, had mm -hmm. to give up the predecessor to this, Ingress, because he became yeah. addicted. He walked many, many miles playing that game, and he hasn't started Pokemon Go. He says, I know I'll become addicted again to it. it yeah. I guess there you do see people kind of uh, compulsively playing it. Oh, all the time. Yeah. They, and, and like you said, they always go in groups. Isn't that? Weird? But I don't mind that because at least they're social. They're talking. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a big it's step. It's want. a big step up from sitting in your boxer shorts playing Grand Theft Auto all night. I yeah, think. I don't know what that's like. No, I, don't know what that's I like. do. I just, Sad I, to say, I do. <laughs> what can I do for you, Chris? Okay, so a good friend of mine the other day um, said, you know, I, he has iOS 10, and I said, well, I don't know how you have iOS 10 unless you're a uh, public beta tester because it's not revealed until, I guess, coming out this fall. Right. And he says, why don't you get it? And I said, huh, I've never I've never done that before. Let me give Leo Laporte, the tech guy, I listen to Renee Ritchie, Mac Break Weekly, and I'm in on everything. It's so. easy to do, and, and we've talked a lot about it. So Apple's done started doing the same thing that Microsoft's been doing for a while, which is, they call it public betas, where they offer anybody, you don't have to be a developer, uh, the opportunity to test the next version of the operating system, as long as you understand it's pre-release, and so we'll have bugs. And The big thing with iOS 10 is uh, some of your software will stop working. The, the, oh, okay. Yeah, so it, and you don't know ahead of time, to be honest, which will work, which didn't. For instance, Pokemon Go didn't work initially. Then they released a new version that fixed it, and that's the whole intent, isn't it? Apple yeah. wants to put out these betas so that companies can fix their software so that when it does come out officially in September, one of the things that happens with iPhones is everybody almost universally updates, very much unlike the rest of the world with Windows and, and Android. It, people don't update instantly, but Apple has conditioned its users, do the update, do it up, do yeah. it up. Yeah. So uh, I've been playing with iOS 10. I, put, I don't use the iPhone day in, day out, so it wasn't a risky thing for me. It's not my daily, what we call daily driver. I'm an Android user. But I have, of course, an iPhone, and I use it a lot. I use it all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I like iOS 10. I think it's going to be controversial. It's the biggest change to iOS in a long time. Uh, some things are easy, people pleasers. The new messages 
lets you do giant icons and invisible ink and all sorts of fun things. They're playing catch up with Facebook Messenger and other WhatsApp and things, but it's it's well done and I like it. And of course, it only works with other people using iOS 10. So it really won't be that useful until it comes out globally in the fall. Okay, I'll wait. And then the uh, other big, di there are two other big differences. One is, and you've heard us talk about it if you've listened to mm -hmm. MacBreak Weekly. Yep. The other big difference is notifications are very different. And I think this will be controversial. And they've also changed how the control center works, that thing you swipe up from the bottom. It's now two pages instead of one. And uh, I don't mind that, but it's going to take some getting used to. I think it'll be a little controversial. I would not upgrade if you if it's your main phone because you some things just won't work anymore, and you may want those things to work. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it's uh, you know, on the other hand, a lot of people do it just because. Well, hey, I want to be on the inside. I want to know what's coming around the corner, and then I can be the expert. And you know, people can ask me, "Well, what do you do?" And of course, as uh, you know, it's my business to do that. So. I had to. I, I wouldn't say do it. I think you can. Oh, hey, it's two months. You can wait two months, right? I can wait two months. Only yeah. eight weeks. I would yeah, wait. I would wait two yeah. months, Chris, if I were you. Hey, I thanks for the call. To to. And thanks for listening to our shows. Always. I appreciate it. Uh, Mac Break Weekly, we do uh, every Tuesday. That's at twit.tv slash mbw. iOS Today, every Monday, twit.tv slash iOS. Good shows if you like those things. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Our show today brought to you by, if you're interested in marketing, you know this is a vast moving, very fast moving subject these days. It, keeping up can be challenging. Well, I got a, a really cool tool for you, the Adobe Marketing Cloud. They do these white papers uh, that are really awesome. And what's nice is they've made them available as podcasts in audio. So if you search for audio white papers for marketing on iTunes, You'll see all of these. They're about half an hour. You can listen to them uh, for free. You can download them, put them on your iPod, listen as you're going to work. If you're a marketing professional or a business owner or you just want to stay up to date on the latest marketing trends and technologies, uh, you're going to love these audio white papers for marketing. You can go to iTunes and just search for audio white papers. You'll find it. It's easy to find. Uh, there are eight right now, and I'm sure there are more to come. You're covering things like uh, the differences between interaction metrics, engagement metrics, and value metrics, and using those to help figure out which of your creative is working, or creating personalized content relevant to consumers using predictive analytics, creating a 360-degree view of each customer, no matter how or where they're interacting with your brand. These are things marketers care about. They're, they're complicated. The Internet has changed a lot of the way we do business. And this is about keeping you up on the latest. And it's free. And by the way, there's no, you know, there's no sell in there. It's just, it's just good content. Uh, I like Adobe for doing this. Audio white papers for marketing. Search iTunes for audio white papers for marketing or visit adobe.com for more information. Audio white papers for marketing. We thank the Adobe Marketing Cloud for their support. All right, I, I probably shouldn't do this. But I really want to do this. Oh, Chris Marquardt, let's just make sure you work. Hi, Chris Marquardt. Hello, can you hear me? I hear you, and you hear me? All I can well. hear you. Can you hear me? I hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, just fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I had the web. I Roger, the Roger. Open, so it was, it was kind of confusing. Oh, is that going? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all good. All right. Be with you in uh, 20 or 10. All right. Thanks. You. See ya. I'm trying to decide whether I should. So this has Ubuntu on it. And that's this is the System76 uh, laptop. And that's what they design it for. And they have their own PPA and everything. But I'm. I think I like I use GNOME three, and I don't think Ubuntu is the best OS for GNOME three. It doesn't they don't keep it up to date as much. Oh yeah, you still have System D, baby. I think you had it in fourteen oh four, didn't you, Archandra? Well, you'd have it in sixteen oh four. I'm thinking of putting uh, uh, instead of Ubuntu, putting my uh, putting uh, Antergos, which is a kind of nice arch. I wonder if I could put BSD on here. I think I could. This is the problem with this is it's um, it's a 980M. I think BSD supports it, and um, 
Yeah, well, this is all Pulse Audio, System D. Uh, I think driver support's going to be a problem. And it's, it's, it's uh, for one thing, it's um, the new kernel, the newest kernel. What is that, 4.6? And, uh, hmm. OS X is not BSD based, really. It's Dar it's got Darwin, but it's not a full BSD. I, I, you know, we'll see. This is kind of a crazy experiment doing the BSD as my main desktop at home. It may may not work, but thank you, Johnny. Mario. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, birthday boy. Thank you. So I'm. Uh, Right now, just burning a USB key with Entergos. We shall see. It's kind of dumb to do it right before Twit, huh? I got three hours. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. If you want to talk high tech, I'd love to talk high tech with you. Answers to your questions... Suggestions are welcome. Corrections, too. 8888-ASK-LEO. Let's go to Canada. Calgary, Alberta. Clinton on the line. Hi, Clinton. Oh, hi, Leo. How are you? I'm doing well. Yourself? Very well. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to say there's, um, there's been three people in my life that have changed my life for the better. Um, my stepdad... Steve Jobs and you. Wow! I'm, yeah. Wow! I'm I, thank you. I'm deeply honored. Thank I don't you. deserve it, but thank you. That's very oh, nice. Oh yes, you do. Uh, um, gosh, I don't know um, how, how the world's going to be what, um, when you move on, but uh, <laughs> I ain't moving on yet. Please don't rush me out of here. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Uh, else, yeah. Uh, so, are you? Do you work in tech? Is that uh, is that how it, uh, I influenced you? Uh, pretty well, much. Yeah. Um, I do know. I we talk, I talk to people all the time who wanted to work in tech, or you know, were, were thinking about it and saw the old TV shows or, or whatever, and said, "Yeah, I think I can do this. I think I can make this my career." And I do meet people like that from time to time. It's nice. It's a, it's gratifying. Yeah. So yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. I, um, yeah. I've been uh, self-employed for hmm, gosh, I think almost ten years now. Nice. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, the reason why I'm calling you is that um, I've been playing around with Raspberry Pi and routers and stuff. Yeah. And um, I've come up with a way so that, um, well, anyway, this goes back to like uh, you once did a show on know-how on how to get free HDMI TV or free uh, high-definition TV. Uh-huh. Anyway, um Ever since I saw that show, I was kind of in awe about it, and I've been <laughs> playing around with it with antennas and stuff for a long time now. And um, what I've done is that um, I have a minivan, right? Uh -huh. And in the minivan, it has a DVD player, and it has it has HDMI ports to so you can plug in uh, con uh, like games and stuff. Uh -huh. So um, I ended up buying this ATS this ATSC converter uh -huh. and an eight dollar antenna. Of Amazon. And so you're getting over the air. ATSC is the unencrypted over the air broadcasts. And I guess in Canada, yeah. there's still a few of those, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. So you got the antenna and you got a receiver. Now, what do you, you want to do? A media center? And, well, I, yeah. And um, I basically, um, and I've just plugged it into my, uh, my, uh, my minivan. And, um, and it works wonderful. Like there's uh, six channels that broadcast in HD TV. Nice. nice. And um, no matter where I go, anywhere in the city of Calgary, um, I always get them. That's great. Don't watch while you're driving. Well, no, you can't. Here's the thing, though, right? Is when the car, when the when the vehicle moves, right? Um, you lose the signal. Uh, I guess. It, I guess. So. Well, really? Yeah. All right. Okay. But as soon as the car is parked or whatever, it's um, good. They, they, all, they, all, they all come back. So, so you want to use, uh, you're saying your Raspberry Pi as a media center? Is that kind of your idea here? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's where it comes in. Um, basically, it's not necessarily Raspberry Pi, but other devices, right? By the way, the Raspberry Pi makes a pretty decent media center. It's not the, 
it's just a $35 computer uh, as as yeah. you know, but I'm telling everybody else um, mm -hmm. that uh, has you know pretty good capabilities, including HDMI high def video out, so um, you can connect it directly to a TV. It doesn't have a video capture mm -hmm. device, so you'd have to figure out some way to get video capture in there. And you'd probably want to run uh, OSMC, the Open Source Media Center, which is designed for Raspberry Pi, and uh, yeah. you can actually run that as your operating system. Father Robert demonstrated that uh, yesterday on our uh, new Screensavers episode. And it really is a nice, really, really great experience uh, based on yeah. the old uh, uh, Xbox Media Center. Yeah. 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 So there are certainly easy ways uh, to do that. The, the issue, of course, is yeah. the video capture device because there's uh, no way to do that. But there are, if you, if you do a search, you'll find lots of how-tos. It'll let you walk through it and... And put everything yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. My question is though, um, I like. Can you like? Can you? Could I like um, load up the Raspberry Pis with that, with all that uh, software? Yeah. And then uh, resell it. Sure. Be breaking laws or no? Is, not at all. Uh, no, not at all. So uh, the Raspberry Pi, of course, you can resell because it's hardware, and you can sell it, resell it. Yeah. Uh, there's no limit on what that. What about like the software that comes? And with then that's it? the beauty of open source software. You're more than welcome to do anything you want with it, including right. um, customize it and uh, resell it. In fact, that's the business model in many respects for open source software. Open source software often is free. Operating systems like Linux and uh, various open source programs like the uh, OSMC, the Open Source Media Center are free the way companies uh, the incentive or ubuntu uh, the incentive for companies uh, to to do this is that they can make money uh selling services or selling integration or repackaging it so it's absolutely fine and legal to make a, a media center using a, a raspberry pi and once you've figured out all the details for yourself that's exactly you know there are people who say well no i'm going to do it myself because i can go online follow the steps and do all that and then there are people who say hey i just want to you know I just want to buy something ready-made. And uh, that's com completely, not only legal, but that's the whole point, if you ask me, of open source software. Generally speaking, uh, you want to put license information on uh, somewhere. I w you know, might want to print out the license for OSMC, if that's what you use. And uh, and give, if you're doing a manual, a paper manual, give that to people with it. Uh, but it's not required because the license is built into the software as well. Yeah, highly recommend it. So, and it's a fun project. Nice way to make money. You could drive around in your van selling media centers out of the back. <laughs> 8880, nice to hear from you. Glad you're listening in Calgary. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number. Our show today brought to you by Carbonite Online Backup, a great solution for anybody who's using a Mac or a PC. You know you have to have backup. I hope I'm not telling you something new. Backup is the only way to get your data back if you... If, if disaster strikes, a fire, a flood, uh, you accidentally throw stuff away, that happens more often than not. Or eh, the real disaster these days, ransomware. You know, you get an email, about 95% of all phishing emails these days are ransomware. You get an email and says, uh, here's your statement from last month from the bank or, you know, a variety of things. You, you say, oh, yeah, you double click it. Don't ever, but you do. Open up that attachment and now... <laughs> You get a message that says, hey, hey, hi, how you doing? We just encrypted all the data on your hard drive. You want that back? You'll be sending us $300. Now, if you don't have a good backup, if you don't have Carbonite, you might panic at that point. But if you've got Carbonite, you go, ah, ah. <laughs> you just get rid of the virus, restore your data from Carbonite, and you're good to go. That's the beauty of a strong backup solution. Automatic, continuous, and off-site where it's safe from ransomware. Carbonite. Try it free. You don't need a credit card. Just my name, Leo. You'll get two months free when you decide to buy. You got to back it up to get it back. Do it right with Carbonite. Take a break for the bottom of the hour. Chris Marquardt, our photo guy. He's just around the corner. More tech coming. Stay here. Mm -hmm. I always am amazed when I see uh, a company um, paying ransomware, you know, like the hospitals or the police departments that get bit. I always am amazed. It's like, you guys don't have <coughs> versioning backup? What? What kind of IT department are you running there? 
Hey Christophe. Hello. Comment ça va? Ça va bien. Ça va très très bien. Très très bien. Where are you going très next? bien. Where are you going next, you traveling man? Greenland in August. Oh. Now Greenland He's... really should have been named Iceland, right? <laughs> and Iceland should have been named Greenland. Yeah, isn't that <laughs> You're very right there. Well. We'll be on a ship, on a schooner, on a German-built oh. three-mast schooner. Oh, that's the one I want to go on. Cruising well. <laughs> no, I can't. I can't. I don't. I want to, but I can't. <laughs> I have duties. We might be doing this again next year. Uh, Possibly. Uh, that would be fun. Got, a, got a whole lot of response. One of these days I'm going to get on one of their uh, workshops. I have to. All right, I'm plugging my Ethernet in here. Oh, crud. It's on the other side. Oh. I'd be more than happy to have you, Leo. You know that. Oh, it'd be fun. It'd be so much fun. I think so, uh, yeah. Well, we're going to take our chances and go to Russia in the fall. <laughs> That'll be Oh, you do? Yeah, we, it's three days in St. Petersburg as part of this cruise. Ooh, oh, that's that's oh, right. Fun. Well, we'll we'll be in uh, Siberia again oh. in February. See, wouldn't that be cool? Baikal, Lake Baikal. Yeah, that was. Those are beautiful pictures. So you're gonna do that one again? We'll do that one again. Nice. Yes, it's been so. Yeah, it blew my mind. Yeah, and not not just you know not just the, not just the location and the and the fo the photo ops also the 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 all your, all, your, all your prejudice that you have about right. Russia kind right. of goes out the window right. the moment you're there and you you just realize what a beautiful culture nice. it is what a, what amazing people you don't they have are. to do that no need to crawl my friend no need to crawl you can just walk <laughs> right in front of the camera people do that and I go that's all you don't need to crawl <laughs> no it was it was, it was yeah well, I am a little nervous I've been to St Petersburg before I went with Henry in um, I want to say 2006 Seven, something like that. But I'm a Why little, nervous. I'm, well, I, you know, I don't know. Things are the world situation. Oh come it's, on, it's unstable. No, no there's no, uh, nothing to fear. Eh, eh. That's uh, must must be an American thing. What? Russia's bad. Germans don't mind. They got to <laughs> travel. They don't care. They're going everywhere. Oh, are we, I I need a visa to go to Russia. It's um, it's the same ordeal that you have to go through. Oh, you know what? I better check. I better. I, I bet I do need a visa. Well, it might be the travel, the tour operator, someone might be taking I care of that to, for I you. But think about that. I forgot. I needed, I needed uh, an invitation from the tour operator and then I had to go through... Well, you can go through a service and pay for someone doing the paperwork for you. And that's what I would do, actually. Yeah. Not a big deal. Yeah, this has to be done deal. in time. I got to do that. I do have to do that. But yeah, there's not, nothing intimidating about it whatsoever. It was really good. And the food. Oh, my God. Really? Ah, the Russians like their, their blini. Love the blini. Got to love the blini. Not, I like the borscht. Not borscht. So, not so crazy about the uh, potatoes and cabbage thing. <laughs> oh, they do that too. That's right. Yeah. But a lot of sour cream with everything. Isn't sour cream nice? makes everything better. Sour cream and vodka, yeah. you could eat anything. No bacon, but it's all cream. <laughs> okay. Hang on. I liked it. I really liked oh, it. Oh, I, you know, I really enjoyed it. And we didn't get to the Hermitage because Henry got sick on our second day. And so this Oops. is going to be, yeah. But we have three days this time. So okay, good. we're going to, we have a lot of stuff planned. Mama, don't take my coat of chrome. Mama, don't take my coat of chrome. Hey, it's time for Chris Marquardt, our photo guy. Chris joins us each and every week to talk about getting better pictures with our digital cameras. He is a photographer by trade. He also teaches great workshops. You'll find them at Discover the Top Floor, going back to Greenland, I guess, in a couple of months. Well, next month. Next yeah, month, in yeah. August, we'll go back to Greenland on, a, on the three-mast schooner, which is going to take us around uh, the east coast of Greenland. So you're going to be a pirate. I'm going to be a pirate. Arr, I'm, I'm a, taking pictures patch. all yes. over the Greenland. Yeah, <laughs> it's gonna be fun. Oh, it's gonna be so much fun. So, uh, what should we talk about today? Well, last week I started this little series about secret superpowers. Your yes. photo secret superpowers. Yes. Um, we started with fireworks. Um, we'll continue with panoramas today. All right. And it's it's one of those topics where I thought it doesn't kind of doesn't belong here. I mean, you have a you have an iPhone or a smartphone. And most even the even the compact cameras are very smart these days. They might 
just have that built in. Uh, when I just, uh, from uh, Norway, I sent a, a panorama that I took with the iPhone and, and put it online and people started asking what camera that was because it looked so great. So these cameras are really good doing that. It is and, amazing, uh, isn't it? I yeah, saw, you yeah. know, I see ads all the time for these special lenses you add to your iPhone. They say, you'll never, you don't have to carry a camera anymore. Just carry your phone. Nah, and these... just shoot a panorama. <laughs> okay, good. It's going to it's gonna do the same thing. Well, it, it might help you with video, but that's, I mean, a, a beautiful panorama. Smartphones are good, but if you want to try the, uh, what I call the advanced method, um, which would be with a bigger camera and it, taking individual shots and then putting them into a panorama. It turns into a two-step process. And pretty much step one is to capture the picture and step two is to then stitch those pictures together. So um, that's that's what you do. And I, I just wanted to uh, give a few tips on how to do that. A lot for of cameras those now. Um, my Sony will do this. My Leica will do this. You put it in Oh, they, and they will stitch it for you. Yeah, even. you put it in panorama yeah. mode. And it That's, just says, yeah. move slowly across the horizon, and then you get it. And it usually does yep. a very good job. The phone, but smartphone. not everyone has these cameras, right. you know. Or if you, if you have a, a, one, one of those big, big DSLRs and things, and there are still people that do that. So a uh, few tips on how to do this in the old way, the traditional way, which also means the way where you have a bit more control, where you don't really have to rely on the on the camera doing everything for you and maybe not getting it 100% right. So the first thing is you want to hold the camera. Well, you want to take multiple shots. That's the first thing. You have to ha take multiple overlapping shots. Okay. Um, you will hold the camera in portrait format, format so that you have more height in the picture. And then just take pictures with, I would say, about a 50% overlap. So don't give it too little overlap or the software will later not be able to get those pictures into one, just won't find the overlapping areas. Um, there are a few areas where you want to take control. When you shoot those individual pictures, the camera will uh, do a few things automatically that can get in the way of the stitching later. Um, the first is the white balance. The camera, every shot you do, the camera will try to get the colors right. But as different angles from where you shoot might have different light, there's a good chance that you have different shots with uh, with not the same white balance, and that makes it hard. So, a manual white balance, step number one. Um, that's the white balance are these little symbols on your camera, the little cloud, or the little sun, or the little um, fluorescent uh, light. Set it to the actual uh, light you're shooting under, and leave it there for taking the panoramic pictures, and that will do it. Second thing is the focus. Now, if you if you have some of the things close, and some of the things far away, um, the camera will focus on those, and then you have pictures with a different focus distance, and that will also kind of get in the way of uh, of the software later being able to stitch those together. So, this is where I go manual focus. You choose what is important in the picture, you focus on that, and then all you do is set the camera to manual focus, and it will just stay there. And then you take all those pictures, and they will all nicely stitch together. And last but not least, the exposure. That's another thing. If you, let's say you shoot a picture, a series of pictures of a sunset, um, you, you will have a picture that is not pointing at the sun and then one where the camera is pointing at the sun and those have a different light in them and that means the camera will do different exposure on them. And then later, the software again will have a hard time stitching those together. So uh, doing manual focus, eh, it's a bit involved, but here's an easy trick to kind of get it um, to get it uh, right without knowing too much about it. And that's, uh, use the automatic setting in your camera and uh, point at where you think which part of the panorama is kind of the most important one. And make a note of the values um, that the camera gives you for the shutter speed, the aperture and the ISO. And then set your camera to manual mode, that's the M symbol. And then transfer those settings just there. And you have the manual setting for that panorama. And that's how you acquire those pictures. And then the second step is then stitching them together in software. And um, lots of there's lots of software out there that will do this. I use Lightroom to do that. And it's called Photo Merge in Lightroom. And you just select the pictures that you want to merge into a panorama, right click on them and then select Photo Merge Panorama. And it will figure out if you have enough overlap, it will figure out the, the the sequence of the pictures that will 
kind of give you a preview of what the panorama will be looking like. It will even take care, pretty good actually, about uh, take, take care of what we call ghosting. Um, if you have, for example, people moving in between two shots inside that overlapping area, you will, um, with older stitching software, you might have a ghost in there, so a person that is just half visible. And um, the software is doing a pretty good job in uh, taking care of this. And then... Really? Uh, so, so like Photoshop, know. you won't get those ghosts still? Because I always well, used it, to get those. It's doing a pretty good job now. The algorithms have really improved and then uh, you, you're not really running into that anymore. Used to be you uh, had to do this all also manually the too, right? But oh, now, yeah. Now they this was... And, and again, this is really an advanced version. So if you have a camera that does it for you, hey, do it. Let the camera yeah, do it. They always do a very a good yeah. job. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, one last trick. If you do it with a multiple pictures version, um, I take marker pictures in the front and at the end. So, you know, when I come back home and I look at all these pictures on the light table in Lightroom, um, just finding those pictures that make up one panorama is kind of tough unless you have something in there that kind of reminds you that, oh, wait, this is where panorama starts and this is where it stops. And what I usually do is I do a thumbs up in front of the camera. Oh. Uh, when I start and another one at the end. And whenever I see a thumbs up, my own hand, probably quite out of focus, then I know that that's, in between those two, that's a panorama. Yeah. Or you could do like a, a frontwards L and a backwards L. Well, I've seen people do this, like point to that, the side, like in the way, direction that, that we're, way. yeah, exactly. Yeah, how funny. So there, there are lots of ways to do this, but uh, some people take a picture of their feet or I don't know. It's, the biggest challenge just I have is uh, I always forget to, if I'm not in manual mode, a lot of my times the camera will kind of be changing the lighting and all sorts of stuff. Do you say do it in manual mode, like set it once and do it all the way across or? That's what I typically do when I do that because yeah. the stitching software will try to 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 kind of even it out and equal, equalize it between the different apertures between the different uh, frames. But it's easier if the camera kind of has a, a fixed value to work okay. with. Okay. Okay. All right. Panorama. You know, you oh. could make a panorama for our assignment. It's not a panorama assignment, but <laughs> you, there's always a time to you know, could do panorama anytime. What is our assignment this month? The current assignment is slow, and slow. I think we'll have to take it slow and leave it up for another couple of weeks at least. Are we not getting a lot of submissions? Is that why? No, no, no. Oh, I think okay. I think we only started it a couple of weeks right. ago. So two more weeks. So here's the here's the deal. Take a picture. It doesn't have to be with a fancy camera. It doesn't have to be a panorama. It just has to is illustrate the concept slow in some way. Tag it with the word slow and upload it to Flickr, and then send it over to the Tech Guy group on Flickr. In a few weeks, Chris will pick three interesting images. But uh, but we'll all see all of your images because it's kind of a fun group over there. So send us your best slow images. Thank you, Chris Marquardt. DiscoverTheTopFloor.com. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. All right. Let's see. Let's install Antergos. Antergos. I, I tried to do it with ZFS and it didn't. It barfed. So I think I'm just going to have to do uh, ext4. It doesn't like this was my concern with this laptop is it's all this new stuff but it sees the wi-fi right now so that's nice is that arch user repository i don't need bluetooth I do want the extra fonts i do want firefox uh libra office firewall smb yes all of those thank you Now, erase and encrypt. Let's use LVM. Maybe LVM will work. Didn't like ZFS. Select the drive. Oh, you know what? Maybe I... Oh, yeah, that's right. And I want the bootloader to be on. Let's just uncheck this here. Bootloader. Okay. 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 I always like to encrypt the drive. Gonna use GNOME. I want to continue. Save that. 
And there you go. Yeah, I, for some reason, didn't like the ZFS. I guess with the NVMe, maybe it doesn't work together. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. No, FreeBSD is not going to be for this laptop. It's going to be for my home. I don't think I, I want to use it here. I guess I could put it on here, but I'm thinking more like I want this beast at home. <clears throat> That's my main PC. A beast. Well, you, don't you always want a boot partition? Is that that's not Grub? I think remember I had problems with Grub two on this, but we'll see. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Invitations went out this week to Samsung's event, August second. What is that? A couple of weeks from Tuesday, something like that. Uh, that's when they're going to announce the new Galaxy Note. The Note is uh, Samsung's very popular, surprisingly popular, really, giant screen uh, phone. Uh, I love the Note. And I remember when I first started using it way back six versions ago, the, the original Note, people laughed at me. They said, <laughs> that giant phone, you're crazy, you're carrying at it. That looks silly. And now it's so commonplace that it, it doesn't look big. It just It's a phone. And the reason I liked a big screen, I think people do like big screens, is because your smartphone isn't really just a phone. In fact, in many cases, it's barely just a phone. I, I don't spend much time on the phone. It's a communications device. It's a computer. It's a browser. It's a video viewer. So you, you want a big screen. You want to be able to see, I think, more on the screen. And, of course, the, the Note's famous because it has a stylus and a pressure-sensitive screen. So it's a little, it's really a mini tablet, uh, but very popular. And we expect that they will announce, announce the new Note uh, on August 2nd. I think they even said they'll announce the new Note. It will not be the Note 6, even though the last one was the Note 5. It's going to be the Note 7 because they want to get the numbers in sync. They have the Galaxy S7. That's their smaller handset. And for their bigger one, they want... The Note 7. So that's what we expect the name will be. The rumors are 5.7 inch screen. It's going to have that edge. Samsung really sees that as a differentiator from the iPhone and everybody else. That that kind of curved screen at the edge, which is very pretty. I mean, it is gorgeous. I have a Galaxy S7 Edge. You can get it in the normal model or the Edge model. I like the Edge. It's beautiful. But uh, you know, it doesn't have any real utility. They they say, oh, we're going to put stuff on the side, like so you could put the phone on the table in front of you and still get messages and things sideways on the edge. I never, I've always turned that off. It's kind of weird. And then it also is true that when you're holding the phone, it's hard not to touch the edge. There's such a, <laughs> there's so little material on the edge of the phone that you're almost inevitably going to touch the screen. And that gives you sometimes stray touches on the screen, which is not good. But it's so beautiful. You know, sometimes beauty is pain. And you just have to live with the pain for a beautiful phone. So uh, I, I think that the, that's the rumors. They'll do a curved edge screen. Unknown whether to do a straight screen. They probably will bring back, I hope they will bring back, the removable uh, SD card. The rumor is the SD card will be back as it is with the S7. Uh, that's nice because then you can add extra, lots of extra storage for your music and your pictures and you know, I listen to audiobooks. I have gigabytes of audiobooks. Now, I like to keep them on the SD card. Uh, I don't think it's going to have a removable battery, though. I think that's kind of the price we pay for thin, you know, glass, beautiful backs. If you, ha if you have a removable battery, we have to have a pry-off plastic back. And I think Samsung doesn't want to do that anymore. Let's hope the battery life is sufficient. A lot of times this giant screen uses a lot of juice. I notice on my S7, though, they seem to have, they've seemed to have made some progress. The S7 screen doesn't use hardly any of the juice. You know, when I look at the battery life on the S7, usually the screen, which on other phones might be 40, 50, or 60% of the overall battery usage, on the Galaxy S7, it's like 4%, 5%, 10%. It's very, it's very parsimonious with the juice sucking <laughs> isn't that what we're looking for is parsimonious juice sucking i think so i don't know i'm it just seems to me every phone, <laughs> every phone should be that way it will not be a giant battery according to the rumors but uh, maybe it'll be enough with uh, with this, the changes they've made with i wonder I, I wonder if it'll have nougat 
the new uh, Android, probably not, probably be Marshmallow. Android Nougat is supposed to come out later this year with the new Nexus phones from Google. Anyway, we'll uh, find out more in a couple of weeks. Just thought I'd pass that along. If you've been waiting, because I know a lot of you uh, have come around and become Note fans. I love it. I love a big screen. And, of course, uh, 5.7 inches would make it one of the biggest screens out there. The iPhone 6S Plus is 5.5 inches. That's nice. Um, Google did make a 6-inch phone, the Nexus 6. That was a little big. Just a, little, a, third of, a third of an inch smaller. That's good. A little six is a little too big. You felt kind of funny with that one. Isn't that funny? There's a, I think there's a sweet spot, right about 5.7 inches. Apparently, that's what Samsung thinks, too. Back to the phones we go. Richard, up the road a piece in Sonoma, California. Hello, Richard. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I would go see, uh, I would go see a band named Parsimonious Juice Sucking. <laughs> okay. Well, let's let's form that band. <laughs> I think that would be an awesome band. I don't know what the music would be. I, think I have it would no be a headbanger for me, but I think I'd still like. Uh, it. it might be industrial kind of, you know, <laughs> lot, like chainsaws and. Uh, Could be yeah. uh, too many uh, too many pipes banging Cement on red mixers. You no, know, yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so I have a Nexus Nine. Well, let me. I'll I'll put it in sad voice. Yeah, I that's the tablet. Well, and they're nice tablets, but uh, apparently Google doesn't want to make them anymore. I signed up for the beta program to load N. Uh oh. I did everything. I updated correctly. Uh oh. And now it can't get past Google. Oh dear. It's just locked up on Google. Um. Brick City. Well, no. Oh no no no! It's never Brick City. Never Brick City. I love that attitude. This is why I'm calling <laughs> no, you. never Brick City. Um, I put in on my Nexus 6. Or I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, my friend Jeff put it on his Nexus 6. I put it on my 6P, uh, the newer Nexus. And I've been using it. It works great. I like it a lot. Um, now, I don't remember, but I'm sure the Nexus 9, their tablet, was rated. You, you wouldn't have been able to do it probably if it wasn't. Approved. Well, part of what stimulated me to do it is I heard Ron on All About Android. He did it to his nine. Okay. And was very happy. So I followed suit. Uh huh. And here uh -huh. I am. Well, remember our boilerplate, our boilerplate, but uh, still to be heated warning that, you know, it's beta software yeah. and your, yeah, yeah. your mileage may vary. There is a way to go into recovery mode and get out of this. Um, so that's that's what I would do. I'm just gonna quickly check to see, but you could Google Nexus Nine recovery mode. Generally, I'm I've... looking. I'm looking at the screen that says recovery mode. Oh, good. I think you engage it by going to you know power and volume down. Right. And when I do that and I choose recovery, I'll do it in real time. And wouldn't it be just wonderful if you were the healing moment that causes this to happen? Yeah. Um, that when I do that, it just goes to back and is stuck at Google. So the first thing to do when you get to that recovery is to wipe the uh, cache and data. Oh, okay. Um, there are, you know, what you're getting is a recovery menu, and there's several things. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. The problem, of course, is if you've corrupted your software. Basically, by the way, it's a computer, so you have an operating yeah. system, and the operating system loads. Recovery mode is a bootloader that loads first, and that lets you, you know, choose the operating system to load. Um, I'm not sure on how you would recover this. You probably what you want to do is download. Here's what you're going to need to do. It's kind of a pain. You got a Windows machine lying around? <laughs> oh, put a gun to my head. No. Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. So you're going to you're going to download the drivers so you can do an ADB and you're going to download the Nexus 9 factory image and you're going to connect it and restore it. That's the short form because I just ran out of time. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Now, hold on cuz we may have we may have a better idea. So, is there is there um, apply rescue over the air to a Nexus Nine? Can you do that? Is there a over the air rescue? Well, that'd be amazing. Yeah, that would be the way to do it, and that's how Max do it, which is so cool. And yeah, I, yeah, uh, which is that you can OTA rescue Nexus Nine. Let me see. 
I need I Ron mean, here. I have a stunningly positive story about somebody with a Chromebook that actually booted into Chrome and went to what we shall call, oh, we're off air, an adult site. Yeah. And when he did, he got one of those pop-up windows saying, call this number, Microsoft, rah, 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 alert, danger, danger. Oh, God, that's funny. <laughs> and he actually did, and they and when he called, because he didn't call me first, and when he did, they he said, uh, they said, what machine are you on? And he said, a Chromebook. And he said there was a long pause, and the guy said, close the Chromebook for 30 minutes and we'll call you back. <laughs> Um, and he called me, and I had him do power wash, That's and he's back to funny. gold. Of course he is. Of course he is. I uh, love Chromebooks. He, he probably didn't even need to do the power wash. That was just some pop-up. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you, you. I thought it was a good yeah, idea. Yeah, no, it's not. You know, that's the beauty of it. it. No harm, no foul. Your stuff is safe. You just yeah. run the power wash. I try to get all my friends to be on Chromebooks because. Yeah, well, you hear me doing that. I know. And uh, I know it bugs Windows users, especially. Yeah, yesterday I said Windows is a virus. Yeah. Yeah, but I. <laughs> I heard you know, that. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> I want that as a T-shirt. <laughs> uh, and I and I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, and I and, and it's not really aimed at the normal person who can you know who's a gamer or has an IT department yeah. or can figure it out. It's aimed at people like your buddy, who yeah. get that pop up, pop up and believe it. Well, he called them. He I mean, he actually them. called them, and I thought, wow. oh my God, you could have been in such trouble if you'd been on a, you know a machine. Yeah. Um. Somebody's saying, it, Dr. Ma I don't know if this is true. Uh, let's see. I think what you want is you want to you want to put the the uh, restore software, the fast boot program on your Windows machine, then you connect it up via USB. You're going to need to download a Nexus 9 stock image, which is Google puts online at developers.google.com. Make sure you get it from Google. Yeah. And then um, I, you just blast it on there. You're never really. Um, Unless you have a hardware failure, which is possible. That thing is older now. Yeah. But presuming that you didn't have a hardware failure, you're never really far from restoring it. It would be nice to do an over-the-air restore, and I don't see that you can do that. Uh, yeah, I have the, I've tried all of the options on the, re, on okay. the restore screen okay. of, you know, either recovery or fracture reset. And, but still, it just ends up stopping at Google. XDA Developers, I'm looking, has a post at uh, the uh, forum there. Uh, OTA update, brick your Nexus 9. Google now provides OTA images, uh, which is what you want, and they can sideload it onto your device. And there's a step-by-step -step on here. Okay. Mar uh, marshmallow hose your device, flash the NDEV preview. I think you should probably try the NDEV again. I think uh, that you just got a bad install. It is yeah. conceivable, and somewhat coincidental but this is when these happen that there's a hardware failure right um, but i'd probably not probably not you should probably be okay. able to fix it it did actually make me go out and score on craigslist and nvidia <laughs> shield which i love i love yeah, the video uh, for the for tv or no, the just, tablet just the regular shield well now there you go how much did you pay for the shield uh, uh with the gaming console i scored it at the right place at the right time for 150 nice and that's actually a much faster, better tablet in many respects. And it's a great, I love the form factor. It's yeah. a perfect mix between the 7 and the 9. Good. Well, so it's not the end of the world. Yeah. No, but it is annoying to have yeah, a... No, it should I work. I love the 9. It's, I yeah. love the 9 for looking at my photographs. Yeah. That's really what I love it for, is looking yeah. at imagery. Yeah. Well, it should, you should be able to get that going. Okay, so developers.google.com, download, side load. Yeah, I would go to the XDA developers site, and you just, if you okay. Google, they, this uh, xda-developers.com, that's a really good place with step-by-step -step instructions for all this stuff. Cool. Okay. Right. Thank hey, you. Thanks for the call. See ya. You Bye. Okay, this isn't working, but I'm going to get it working. I'm still using this Nexus 7. This is my uh, my timer. Which I love. The Tech Guy Podcast brought to you by Zip Recruiter. I kind of want to reach out to the person who is doing hiring. Whether you're a sole proprietor and it's all on your shoulders or you work at an HR department, whatever your situation is, you know that hiring is the single most important thing you do at your company. The employees you hire can make you or break you. You can hire a great employee who's going to transform your business. You can hire a terrible employee that is just going to cause problems down the road. The key is to get that right person. 
and to figure out how that, you know, where that right person is, how to reach that right person. This is a challenge because, well, there's the Internet, of course. That's good news. But the problem is that there's hundreds of job boards and that that right person could be only on one of them. That's why I love ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter posts to 100 plus job boards with a single click of the mouse and not just job boards, Facebook and Twitter, too. So you have the highest possible chance of reaching that perfect person. And they make it easy for you, too, because, of course, you're going to get a lot of applications when you're on all those job boards. But they don't come to your phone. They don't come to your inbox. They come to the ZipRecruiter interface where it's easy to rank all of the candidates, screen out the ones that don't work, and hire the right person fast. ZipRecruiter is used now by over 800,000 businesses. More than 131 million candidate applications have been delivered. It's easy. It's the way to find the right person in any city, any industry, anywhere in the country. And with their unique mobile apply process, it'd be much easier for you to reach people. More visitors, more applicants, because they could do it on their phone. I love it! You could quickly screen candidates with real-world questions using free-form, multiple-choice, or yes-or-no formats. You can view their responses in conjunction with their resumes formatted just for you. You can rate them and hire the right person fast. Zip Recruiter, we used it to hire, uh, most recently, a new editor. And we love it. We love it. ZipRecruiter.com slash tech guy. Hire the right person fast. It makes your life easier, makes your company better. And it's really affordable. In fact, we've got it for you for free if you go to ZipRecruiter.com slash tech guy. Try it for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash tech guy. We thank them so much for their support of the Tech Guy podcast. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the Tech Guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, and all that jazz. 8888. Ask Leo. That's uh, my phone number. Uh, let's see. Going on with the show and uh, Stana in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Hello, Stana. Hey, how you doing? I'm well. How are you? Good. Hey, um, I, uh, we have a Time Warner cable and um, I found out that Charter bought them out. So I don't know if any like changes are coming out and about, but. I ended up getting rid of my TV and keeping my internet. You're and what's called a cord cutter. Yeah. <laughs> Even though there's still a cord. Yeah, yeah. There's always a cord. Um, so I'm, I still want to get some cable channeled, so I'm wondering what the best route to go is. I was looking at a Roku, and I know there's like an Apple TV and an Amazon uh, Fire Stick and stuff so i'm wondering what the best route to go is <laughs> yeah this is a th th this is a transitional period right now going from paying for cable service and getting your all your stuff through the cable company to getting everything through the internet they call it over the top which doesn't really make a lot of sense but from the cable company's point of view instead of going through them to get your content you're going over their heads and getting it yeah. through the internet and all of the boxes you mentioned really are very simply a way to connect your tv to the internet the problem is that some of the stuff you want isn't on the internet so for instance mm -hmm. your local news you know from your local tv you know your channel four news is probably not on the internet um, and this means, especially for live events like the uh, Academy Awards and the Super Bowl, you're not going to be able to, a lot of sporting events, watch them if you don't have your local stations. Now, Well, I do have the local stations. See, that's um, if you get them over the air, is that what you're getting? Um, I still have, the house is still wired up with, um, a regular coaxial cable, so I got to use a, a cable modem for the internet. Yeah. So I just plug the TV into it, and I'm still with that. I'm getting all the do you, regular. Do you have an antenna? I do not know. <laughs> well, so you do have it. Then you're getting some sort of cable. Uh, yeah. I so you haven't you haven't cut the cord entirely. You're just getting basic cable, maybe. Um. 
I really wouldn't call it cable because it's all your standard. Yeah, cable, it's basic. Like it's ABC, what they. NBC. Yeah, so it's basic cable. Yeah. So, oh, okay. um, that, yeah, so that's easiest. You're still paying the cable company for Internet Plus TV, yes. um, but you're paying less. You're getting basic cable and you're getting your locals. And that solves a lot of problems. So that's one way to do it. If you live near enough a city to have an antenna, that's another way to do it. You can get those locals over the air. And that solves the real problem because now you're wondering, well, how do I watch, well, I don't know, Game of Thrones maybe or Showtime or and and. Both HBO and Showtime, the premium networks, do offer their services over the top. You have to pay them for that. So HBO, for instance, has two apps that will run on your Roku uh, or your Amazon TV or your Apple TV. One's called HBO Go and one's called HBO Now. This is very confusing. Thank you, HBO, for making this so confusing. HBO Go is for people who are already paying the cable company for their HBO service. And okay, I gotcha. And now what you do when you launch HBO Go is you log into your cable company. You'll log into the Charter website. They'll verify if they choose to. And by the way, in, at least with Comcast, that sometimes they don't choose to. They only recently said, oh, okay, you can use HBO Go on a Roku. So if they choose to, they'll allow it. Then the HBO Go will have all of your HBO pro, uh, shows without paying for it. Because you're already paying for it with Comcast or Charter or Time Warner. Uh, HBO Now is their over-the-top service, and I think it's, I want to say, 10 or $14 a month. And then you don't have to have cable service. You're paying HBO directly. This is how HBO would like to do it, by the way, because the cable company takes a chunk of it, right? They'd love to offer it over the Internet to you, but they're in a kind of a pickle because they don't want to annoy the cable companies because still, for most of their subscribers, that's how they see HBO. They're not yet all Internet. So we're in this weird transition phase where companies like HBO and Showtime really love the idea of selling directly to you because they get more of the pie, but they're reluctant to annoy the cable companies. So they kind of have to. Channels I'm looking to get are more like the news channels, so like CNN, Fox News, right. MSNBC, stuff like that. Yeah, and so um, some of them do that. For instance, CBS just launched uh, their own app for uh, iPhones that has a live component that has much of the local, I mean, the uh, national CBS stuff on it. CNN, you can use their app to watch CNN. And so for that, the best way to do it is, do you, what kind of phone do you have? Do you have an iPhone or an Android phone? Uh, Android, I, okay. uh, um, a Galaxy. If you had an iPhone, it's very easy because you can, if you have an Apple TV, you could take anything that you're watching on your phone, including CNN, and put it on your television through the Apple TV using AirPlay. On Android, they use something called Chromecast. This is a $35 doohickey. It has an HDMI port. I've heard of that, yeah. yeah, it's great. Everybody should have one, because especially if you have an Android phone or an Android tablet, because you plug it into your TV, and then, and this depends on the app. Some apps are Chromecast enabled. I can't remember if the CNN app is or not. I think it is. So then you launch the CNN app, you start watching CNN on your phone, and then you Chromecast it. You say, okay, now put it on my TV. And that's the same as watching live CNN. Uh, okay. uh, Fox may do this as well. So, again, this is over the top, and they, you know, they have mixed feelings about this because they don't want to annoy the cable companies, right? And, in fact, sometimes their contracts prohibit this. But where they can, they will because they want to. They ultimately know we're going to get a bigger so chunk of the pie if we do it this way. I got a little more to add to the mix then. Okay. Um, I also have a shop, which is at another location, yeah. and we need to have TV, internet, phone over there. So I'm paying for all of that over there, but they allow us to, like, log on to certain, like, place uh, stations and actually view them live but not all of them it's only a select so right. i'm able to do that here so i guess what's the that's because you pay for business class service yeah it's an arm and a leg to pay it's for a that. lot more because you're in a business yeah yeah you never want to pay that price but i guess yeah. because you're paying so much they're gonna have to they give you a little concession yeah we're gonna you know there's there's things like um uh you know there's different services that you can get uh, that will allow you. This. For instance, ESPN and Disney channels are on Sling TV. You can pay ten dollars a month and get that. I th 
Fox may be on that. You just, but the problem is it's all scattershot. Like, well, you got to get that app and this app, and you're going to have this device and that device. We're in a transitional phase where it's really ugly. Okay. So, so I guess what would be the best device to get? Because I go like, you have the Roku, you have Amazon. I think Roku is the best. The only thing that the Roku doesn't do is iTunes. So if you bought or rent TV and movies or music on the Apple iTunes store, it doesn't sound like you do, then an Apple TV is the only way you can watch it because Apple wants you to be all Apple. If you're not in the Apple ecosystem, Roku is easily the best choice. It has the most channels, the most variety. Uh, I like Roku and I like the technology that you're using. I, I, you know, I have them all. In my so in my living room, I've got eight boxes all connected to the TV. It's crazy. Um, so how is the Roku different from the Chromecast? The Chromecast just Chromecast. There is a difference. The Roku is a standalone device that does it all. The Chromecast, you use your phone to send the video over to the Chromecast, and then the Chromecast takes over and plays it. But it has no interface. You have to use the phone or the tablet to control the Chromecast. It also has limit more limited choices. I'd get both. Frankly, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888 ask Leo the phone number. I think, you know, we're exciting times for internet TV. Sometimes they call it IP TV because IP stands for Internet Protocol. The idea that all of your stuff should come over the internet. You know, I mean, you might get your internet from a cable company, but you might get it from some other source. But the point is that you don't need to be paying the cable company for content. Pay the content creators for content. The content creators love this idea. Cable company, not so much. But but they but they know it's coming. They understand that. And so you see what they've been doing. They've been slowly raising the cost of internet so that, you know, let's say you pay them as I do, because I buy, you know, all the cable package and the internet package. And it's about a hundred bucks a month. It's a lot, isn't it? I don't like to think about it, but once you do it, you know, kind of it's on your credit card. You don't think about it. They would love to, you know, they know they're going to lose my HBO subscription and my TV subscription. So they want to get the, the, the Internet up to about 100 bucks a month uh, so that they don't lose money. That's going to be a challenge. They've got it pretty close, though. I think it's 60 bucks a month without TV. So they're getting there. And they've been doing this over a period of time because they know this is the future. People are going to be getting everything over the Internet. And they have kind of a monopoly, right? There's only one cable company in town. Uh, there's usually only one phone company in town. And those are your two choices for internet access. You know, it's not like you got 80 choices. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. We go to Tony in Woodland Hills, California, our next call. Hi, Tony. Hi, Leo. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing well. I've got this uh, Windows 7 laptop, and uh, I would like to replace the current drive with an SSD and then do a uh, dual booth with Windows 10. Would that be possible? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, you have a couple of ways to do this. Uh, first thing I would do is, is just replace your drive. And what you're going to want to do is... Uh, there's a couple of things you can do. When you buy a new hard drive, the company that sells the hard drive, Western Digital, Seagate, Samsung, because you're probably going to buy a Samsung SSD, right. they'll offer a program for copying, sector copying, they call it, the contents of the old drive to the new drive. So if it's a, is it a laptop or a desktop? A laptop. Yeah, a little more complicated because you pr most laptops can only have one drive at a time. On a desktop, you'd put the new drive in, but you wouldn't make it the boot drive. You'd, do the co you'd run the program, copy the old drive over to the new, then take out the new drive and let it boot to the... Or take out the old drive, rather, and let it boot to the new drive. On a laptop, it's a little harder. You, um, you, it might be easier just to reinstall uh, Windows 7, put the new drive in and reinstall it, back up your data. You could also, if you wanted to, get an external drive, do an image copy of your laptop hard drive. Actually, I would prefer to do a clean install of yes. it as well. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So once you do that, once you've got when the new drive in and Windows 7 is running, then you want to do the Windows 10 upgrade. And now you want to do this before July 29th. The upgrade is free until July 29th. So, right. Uh, so you want to hurry on this because uh, Microsoft's going to start charging you after that. They're pretty clear. They're, they're, okay. There's not going to be a, 
you know, a grace period. That's it. Uh, so you'll want to do the Windows 10 upgrade. And in the install process, you can, you can, it'll say, I see Windows on here. And it'll give you the chance to do a dual boot. I see. So that's, that's probably the easiest way to do it. You could also, it's a laptop, so uh, yeah, you really, unless your laptop can support two drives, I was going to say you could keep the old drive. I uh, know it cannot. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. if you Google, and I would Google Windows 10 dual boot, there's going to be some useful information, things to watch out for, pitfalls. Uh, I'm looking at an article from PC World that says, you can dual boot Windows 7 with Windows 10, but there's a catch. <laughs> so you're going to want to read, that's Lincoln Spector's article, you're going to want to read the details about this. And he has a step-by-step. -step. It's, it's not as immediately a clear, you, what you want to basically do is use the disk management utility to create a, a new partition, a new blank partition, and install Windows 10 on that. Okay. Now, um, will I be able to uh, update Windows 7? Uh, it's not going to expire yeah. after I no. get Windows 10? No, it does not expire. No. Nope. Okay. So they understand, Microsoft understands that there are plenty of people that will want to have both for compatibility reasons. Right. And so, and and absolutely. No, no. They could, As long as Windows 7 has not reached end of life, they will continue to update that forever. Okay, sounds great. And the thing to understand now, and Satya Nadella has said this, the CEO of Microsoft recently, just a couple of days ago, he says, we now see Windows not as a desktop operating system, but as a software service. And that's kind of a, in Silicon Valley, that has, me, that has meaning. <laughs> to normal people, it's like, what? I don't, what's the difference? But what, so let me translate. Translate the geek speak. What he's essentially saying is, we don't really see ourselves in the business of selling Windows 10 and, you know, do a next, as we have been in the past, every few years, now there's Windows 11. Then in a few years, there's Windows 12. And then you slowly cut off the older versions and move. No, this is it. Microsoft sees the world is changing to such a degree that the idea of buying a new operating system every four years is no longer makes sense. It's not going to be... In a, mark my words, they won't be calling it Windows 10 in a few years. It'll just be Windows, and it will be permanently updated. That's it. You're done. And you'll get free upgrades for life, and there won't be another version of Windows until, you know, there's a new CEO and Microsoft changes course or something like that. But I don't anticipate that. Because really, the, operating, the whole idea of selling and making money on an operating system has changed. Microsoft sees itself now as a device what they call a devices and services company that's if you go to microsoft.com it says that at the top of the page we're a devices and services company the devices are the surface book and the surface pro and this windows phone to some to some degree i guess still uh and the services are the cloud services azure and uh, office 365 and windows and I think that they really see this as the future. For instance, if you buy Office now, mo most likely you won't buy a copy of Office. You won't go to the store as you used to, go down to Staples and get a big box for $800, and that's Office. You'll subscribe to Office 365. You'll pay 8 to $20 a month, and that's it. You're done. Every month you'll pay that, and there's no new version because it's just automatically updated forever. Software, they call it SaaS, software as a service. And Microsoft's wanted to do this for years. They love the idea of a subscription annuity. It's not bad for us because if you think about how expensive Windows used to be and how expensive Office used to be, the idea of a monthly fee is, is preferable. And I don't think they're going to charge a monthly fee for Windows if you jump on this Windows 10 upgrade now. You don't, by the way, if you're not, if you're saying, I don't want Windows 10, still do it. Do the upgrade, then roll back to your previous version of Windows, Windows 7 or 8.1. Roll back, but now you've authenticated, you've made Windows 10 be part of your computer system, and you can do it now. You can get Windows 10, download it, and put it on there anytime from now on. Do that before the 29th. This is it. Your last chance to get it for free. 12 days left. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls right after this. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 88, 88, ask Leo. Thanks to Nathan Staten, our musical director, baton in hand, with some of the best music. I just love the 
bumper music he picks. Also to Kim Schaffer, our phoner. She answers the phones, grooms you, prepares you for your appearance on national radio like Tom in St. Louis, Missouri. Hello, Tom. Hi, Leo. How are you? I've been a long-time listener since 1998 and a little program called Screensavers. Oh, my, my. The good old days. You know, yes, we do uh, the new Screensavers now. It's not quite as good, I have to admit, but it's pretty good. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And, and uh, I want to thank you for your time and trouble uh, devoted towards... Uh, uh, educating the public out here with uh, computers and TVs and such, which leads me to my question for you. Sure. Um, I, I'm in the same spot as a, a previous caller who is trying to cut the cable and, yeah. and probably have a, progressed a little bit farther than her. My sons and I have installed, uh, uh, I guess it's an app called Cody on oh. my Fire TV. Love it. Used to be Xbox Media Center, XBMC, but they renamed it Cody, K-O-D-I. Right. And, and my question is, knowing, knowing the way the world works, how does Cody generate income <laughs> and uh, the, the streaming apps that go with it? Cody's an open source project. Uh, a lot of people are baffled by this notion of programmers working for free, um, <laughs> but uh, they do it. Uh, and they do it not for free. They do it not for money, but for other things like glory and and recognition and sometimes because uh, they care and they just want it badly enough sometimes because they um uh you know get jobs out of it but that's one of the beauties of the uh, entire open source movement and it wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for linus torvalds a finnish graduate student back in 1992 who wrote a unix-like operating system he called it linus's minix or linux and he just he gave it away, kept the copyright, but gave it away. But the other thing that was really critical to this was the Internet, the advent of the Internet, and the ability for programmers to from all over the world to work together on a project without being in the same room. And Linux, you know, inspired a lot of people to write new software. The Free Software Foundation uh, took advantage of this, you know, sudden growth and in interest in this. And now there's free software everywhere. And I think in the long run, this is kind of the future. I really do. Uh, more and more, you're using, whether you know it or not, free software. Even Macintosh is based on a foundation of free software. And, uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm guessing the same could be said about uh, Exodus, the app that attaches itself to Kodi, and, right. and those other streaming apps. In many cases, yeah. Now, you'll notice on the Kodi website, there's a donate button. And uh, you're, 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 I think people often will give money. I do. For, for open source products... Projects, I should say, that I use a lot. If they ask for donations, I often do that. Um, but it's not it's not required. It's not necessary. Um, there are other ways to make money in open source. For instance, I bet you some of the Kodi developers make money building Kodi systems, integrating Kodi systems, supporting Kodi systems, things like that. A lot of the Kodi plugins, though, are just written by fans. Uh, we have a Kodi plugin for my podcast network, Twit. I don't even know the guy who wrote it. He just wrote it because he wanted it, and then he put it up on uh, the, on the website so people could download it. So right. it's kind of it's hard. I know it's hard to believe in this day and age that people would do things out of altruism just because they feel like it, but <laughs> they do, and okay. God bless them for it. And and which brings me to my second question. I guess if uh, I know with every good there must be some bad, some bad. Um, and I've been looking on the internet and finding out what a VPN is, and is it necessary <laughs> for me to get that? Uh -huh. um, necessary is a strong word. If you use Wi-Fi in public on Wi-Fi access points, or if you use networks as you travel at a hotel, on a cruise ship, you're somewhat vulnerable because you're on a public network that bad guys could get onto and try to take advantage of. There are ways and ways they can take advantage of it. It's not necessarily that they can spy on you, although if you're not sending encrypted traffic, they can. But also they can trick you. They could put up fake access points. They could see what access points you're using uh, and then set up a fake one and get you to sign into it or your machine to sign into it without your knowledge start using it, become a man in the middle. So what a VPN does is it just, it, it sets up a connection between your computer on a public access network 
and a computer somewhere else run by a trusted party, the VPN provider, or you, by the way, you can run your own VPN. Businesses often run VPNs. It stands for Virtual Private Network. Uh, that's where they really started was businesses would set up a VPN so their employees could log in from off-site and be on the corporate network and do so securely. So all the data that's transmitted over a VPN is encrypted, so it's not visible to anybody else on that network. It also kind of protects your machine. In fact, what I use is a VPN hardware device so that the bad guy not only can't see my traffic, they can't even see my machine. They, don't, they only see the VPN router. Uh, I use something called the Tiny Hardware Firewall. You can find it at tinyhardwarefirewall.com. And it's just a hard, it's like a little hardware router that does the VPN. Uh, and that works quite well uh, as, in terms of security. Do you need it? Is it necessary? Yeah, I have mixed feelings about that. I, I've lately become more concerned about the dangers post, posed by using public networks. Um, but most, most of what we do is you know, innocuous. Uh, if you're doing something important like banking or using a credit card, chances are you're doing it on a secure network. Email, if you're using Gmail, for instance, it's secure. Uh, so I just be judicious about what you do in public. And if you really want to be safe, and I do this, by the way, I'd use a VPN, yeah. Okay, and, and so you're saying that if you have a home network, that it no. might not necessarily be... No, you're all right. The only person that can spy you on your home network is your internet service provider. People use VPNs for that, too, by the way. Some internet service providers are better than others. Some of them spy on you for want of a better word uh and they have it they have the best by the way people worried about google don't worry about google worry about your isp that's the biggest danger they can see everything you're doing they can track everywhere you go uh so people who are worried about their isps um use vpns often and that that prevents your isp from knowing what you're doing on the internet otherwise your isp does know Okay, and, and as, a, as a footnote, uh, I don't need to talk about Cody in, in closets and whisper about it because of... No, Cody's legal. <laughs> okay, okay. Cody's right. legal. Now, you can put BitTorrent on it, uh, and that's legal, but it can be used to do illegal things, download uh, pirated movies. That would be illegal. So BitTorrent itself is not illegal. Cody is certainly not illegal. Uh, but you can do things that violate... Illegal is a harsh word. Let's say violate copyright. Which is illegal. <laughs> and I, I guess the reason I have this attitude is because I feel if, if I'm not paying for it, it, it must be illegal. I know. <laughs> nope. You're doing it. You're relying on the kindness of strangers. They, um, people, look at people, programmers are an interesting breed. Very often, uh, they just do things because for the challenge of it, because they love it, for the, the reputation, uh, and, and they just enjoy doing it. Uh, I, I've written, I used to when I was a younger man write software and I gave it all away because um, I didn't want to make money on it. I just wanted to do good. That's fine. That's great. You'll see more and of I, that in time, I think. And I guess I guess that's what Windows Windows Corporation, Windows 10 being free is, is what they're... No, at. that's a different kind of free. That's free as in free <laughs> beer. Like you don't have to pay for it. I'm talking free as in liberated. It also happens in many cases to be free as in beer. But it's but free as in freedom. Uh, and that's the idea of free software is that no corporation, no and often no government entity can can see what you're doing. Uh, you're, you can see what the code is doing. You can modify it for your own use. That is really, I think, the future of software. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. Last segment of the show. I hate it when that happens. Well, I'll be back next week with more. And, you know, all week long, I talk obsessively about technology on our podcast network, This Week in Tech, T-W-I-T. -T. You can find it on the web at twit.tv. It's also on iTunes and, you know, everywhere you get your podcast. Just search for twit. I'm the chief twit. <laughs> uh, by the way, that's my Pokemon Go handle. If you see me in a gym, a Pokestop, say hi. Okay. <laughs> Kevin in L.A., Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Kevin. Hey, Leo. How you doing? I, I'm, I've been listening for many years, listen most weekends, and I love the show. Wonderful. Thank you. I um, I have a question for you about a GoFundMe campaign that I'm about to launch. I'm oh. at UC Santa Barbara 
film major. Okay. And I'm in, just about to start my senior year, but um, I've enrolled in the study abroad program. And um, basically, I'm going to Royal Holloway, London University for my senior year. Congratulations. That's exciting. Thank you. I, I, it's like a lifelong dream for me to wow. study abroad. Do they have a good film time. school there? They do. They have a great film media department. Nice. Yeah. So um, the cool thing is that I'm actually covered on everything through grants and scholarships and loans once I'm there. It's the getting there that I'm launching this GoFundMe campaign for, and it's basically, you know, everything I need to do to get there, you know. Right. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not cheap getting a visa and the flight and, you know, taking care of campus fees and this and that and everything in order to get over there, you know. So I thought, hey. Why not? Launch. Now, this yeah. is a, a whole new category of um, uh, Internet stuff called crowdfunding. The idea and Kickstarter does it. Generally, companies that are creating products will use Kickstarter to raise money to make a product. Uh, and there's never a guarantee on Kickstarter. Uh, that the money will uh, uh, buy anything. You're just taking a chance. That's important to say because I think sometimes people think it's a store. It's not. Nor is it an investment. You don't get shares in the company when you give them money on Kickstarter. But sometimes you can get some pretty cool stuff and you get the good feeling that you're helping it out. Uh, the problem with, of course, Kickstarter is they are limited to companies. They're limited. To, they're pretty restrictive on who can use it. So other sites have emerged, CrowdRise and so forth, uh, Patreon for creators, podcasters, and musicians, and GoFundMe for anybody who just wants to put a page together to raise money. They call it crowdfunding uh, for anyone. And the, the range of GoFundMe projects is quite big. I mean, a lot of times it's medical bills. Uh, sometimes it's something like you. It's for educational purposes. Um, and I think, you know, it's fun to go there. And if you've got a, a couple extra bucks, um, you know, to go there and uh, and help somebody out is great. You know, my suggestion is uh, certainly create the site. There's no reason not to. Don't expect strangers probably to kick in uh, mm -hmm. because they don't know you, Kevin, and they don't have much investment in your success in the film uh, business. Uh, but I would certainly let everybody know that you're doing this and, uh, and, and hope that family and friends will kick in a buck or two and, and help you do it. I think it's a great idea. There's... You know, I would certainly, uh, I would certainly do it. A lot of these, it doesn't have to be charitable. It doesn't have to be, you know, it could be a lot of different reasons. Here's somebody who wants to raise money for their dog that needs a surgery. Um, in fact, you see a lot of pets on there. Attorneys' fees, cancer treatment, um, you know, birthday adventure. There's a lot of stuff on here. That's part of the problem. Is there's a lot of stuff on there. There's literally. Thousands and thousands of people are using GoFundMe to raise money right now. Um, they have raised a lot of money. They say two billion dollars to date. So the wow. key, the key is going to be for you to get the you know get the word out to family and friends. I wouldn't count on uh, donations from strangers. Although you never know, there are people who, if you write a compelling story, maybe uh, you know Steven Spielberg will see it and say, yeah, I think this kid's got something here. I'm going to kick in a thousand bucks. He was once a, my fingers. He was once a struggling film student too, right? Right. What's the? Uh, have you set the page up? Page up? I did set it up. Yeah, and I've, been, I've spent some time editing it yesterday. Uh, and uh, tell me, tell me, it. so people who are listening can uh, find it. How to? What, what's? What should I search for? Uh, search for Kevin Dorian, D O R I A N, or getting to Royal Holloway. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, okay, nice. In fact, uh, yeah. I hope you. I hope you. Uh, how much money do you think you're going to need to raise? Well, I, my target, uh, in, you know, figuring in fees because I think they charge about eight percent that goes directly to GoFundMe. I'm putting it at five thousand. Wow. wow, that's quite a bit. So, wow, they take a yeah. big chunk. Yeah, I didn't know what it was when I signed up and started creating the page, but then I found out. So I was like, okay, maybe I should think, tell people about this. Yeah. I'm looking at raising about $4,500 that will actually get me there. Once I'm there, I'm good. I'm, I, I, I love UC Santa Barbara for their financial aid department for 
you know, helping me out. And, uh, you know, it's actually, believe it or not, it's costing me $5,000 less in student loan debt to go there for my senior year than it is to study on campus. Yeah. Yeah, that's where that was what really breaks my heart is when I see people go into such great debt for their education, debt that they may never be able to pay off, or it'll certainly take them decades to pay off. Uh, yeah, education is such a great right thing, and I, I just we've got to find a way to make it uh, more widely available because it's the single, I think, the single most important thing a nation can do uh, for its young people is to help is to give them opportunity. And education is a big part of that. So, well, I wish you good yeah. luck. I wish you good luck. Thank Say, you very much. Yeah, Leo. everybody. Uh, if anybody wants to help Kevin out, uh, go GoFundMe.com. Uh, help him uh, make his make his way to Royal Holloway. Candy is in Palmdale. I think our last caller of the day. Hi, Candy. Hi, Leo. What can I'm I really do nervous. for you? Oh, don't be nervous. Well, from the first girl I have, um, I live in my motorhome now, and I need to get some. Um, I just got Amazon TV, but I don't know how to do everything else. But my main just keeps crashing, and I computer. Oh boy, the phone is cutting out. So you got a you got a new laptop, and it keeps crashing. Yes, when I make I use this program called Adapt to make pictures to make good pictures of my dog. Oh. And, uh, and uh, when it, when you say crash, what happens? What kind of crash? What is well, it says, um, it says um, that has crashed, and it, it, it erases all everything I, I've done. To, like, so it's not the computer that's crashing, just that program. Yes. Actually. Windows isn't crashing. You can keep going. Yes. So uh, it could be that that program is not a great program. What's the name of it? I didn't catch it. It's called PIZAP, P-I-Z-A-P. And I was going to ask, you know of one I could use that... I could cut out things and put them on there. Yeah, there are. Uh, I don't know that program, to be honest with you. Um, there are a lot of photo editing programs, many of them for free. Um, where do you do you store your photos on Google Photos, for instance? Uh, well, I'm sort of storm right now because I just got you know this new computer. Oh, I got um, a, a a drive that you download. Do you have it, Do you have internet access? Yes, I do. Try Aviary. It's free. It's online. A V I A R Y. It's a photo editing service that's quite good. I really like it, and it's free. I think I think you will like it, and it won't crash. And even if it does, you'll have a copy on the net. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows on the Netcast Network. It's called TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security on Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. You even get your daily dose of tech news with Tech News Today. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, this Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.